Hello everyone. So before EA launched, I put out a guide that had baseline builds for every character in their traditional role, just as a way for us to have a jumping off point so we could get in, we could play, we could have some fun. Well, it's been a little over a week now, week and a half, and we have a lot of hours in the game. We have had so much fun playing and testing and figuring out different action interactions, and it's now time for us to take an in-depth look at the item system. So this video today, we're going to be looking at every hero and almost every role that they can play, at least with some normal viability. Now, use the timestamps in the description, use the chapters, but I highly recommend that you watch the first little bit of this before we get to the heroes themselves, because it's going to give you some key information so that you can understand some of the other resources, understand the video itself, and so you can start to build and create builds for yourself if you so desire. Now, when you get to the heroes themselves, watch the hero kit portion. That's where a lot of the thought process behind the builds is going to come through. And then you go to the role that you're actually interested in for that given character. A few quick notes before we jump into builds themselves. We don't have formulas yet. There's a lot of information we don't have. We don't have a lot of statistical information that we can aggregate and put together. A lot of that is coming within the first season, which is great. But there's also specific formulas on calculating effective HP that we don't have because we don't have the damage formula. We don't know exactly how armor is calculated in, how pen is calculated in, where some of these multipliers fall in the damage formula, and all the things like that. As we get that information, I will continue to put out videos so that we can refine our builds, so that we can get more efficient with everything. But just keep that in the back of your mind that all of this video is subject to change. We know even that within the next week, week and a half, we're going to be getting our first balance patch. If I understand the roadmap correctly, I think that's also when we will get Countess. Not 100% sure on that. They might be doing balance and the Countess might come a little bit later in the month. We'll see. But regardless, things are going to change. Again, the core idea behind this video is to give you the thought process behind these builds, give you some ideas on how to understand the hero kits and what directions you want to really look when you're building items and everything like that. Now, because a lot of this information is subject to change and we want to have some longevity in the information that we were putting out there, there's another key resource that we're giving to you guys. That will be the first link you see in the description below. And what it is, is this spreadsheet. So when you open it up, you'll see this page. It's going to give you some good information on how I put this together, some of the kind of key things to keep in your back of your mind as you're looking at and everything, and then some useful links. Huge shout out to Artisan who has been helping me put all of this together. I would not have been able to do this in the time frame that I have without her. It's been amazing. So as you get into this though, the kind of key piece of information, you, you can start at the directory and you can see we've got all the heroes listed here and we will continue to add to this as new heroes come into the game. We've got the different roles, they all linked here. And let's go and let's jump, let's say you're interested in Steel Offlane. So you click on that and it will take you to Steel's page. As you can see, we've got the hero, we've got a link back to the directory on every page so that you can quickly move between characters and roles as you need to. And then if you, you know, without having to scroll through the bottom in particular. And then, yeah, you can go in, you can look. All right, steal offlane. Let's take a look at this real quick. So first off, you'll see that we have a bunch of items listed here. This is going to give you kind of the crest, the best crest options for that particular role the core items and situational items, which we'll talk more about what that actually means here as we get into the examples of the video itself. And then we'll have some other little sections, mostly this for any tank thing, where if you are playing a character that needs more durability or is building for that purpose, for the sake of making it easy, we've got this set of options that are kind of always available to every tank no matter what. And then also, when you're looking at it, you will see that you will have builds that are highlighted 
in green. These are your recommended builds. If we go back to our hello page, you can see the recommended builds are highlighted in green. These are kind of your baseline builds that are jack of all trades that will cover a lot of your bases and give you real well give you everything you need for that particular role and then also maybe push some aspects of the hero's kit and things like that but then we will also have other builds other example builds that are perhaps theory crafts that are sometimes a little wacky things that we have done for fun that we've found some level of success with it's just an idea to it's just a way for us to have a bunch of different builds to inspire people these are examples and you can take this and you can run with all of these different ideas and get a feel for what works for you so as you figure out putting things together and what feels good for you there's kind of a few key points that i want to talk about and just building with a purpose this will help give you a foundation for looking at the, these builds and understanding why they're in the order that they are, why you have some of the things in there that you do. And the first thing I want to talk about is just build order and timing. So your first Fang Tooth fight is normally going to happen within five to eight minutes. Your first Orb Prime fight is going to happen right around that 20 to 25 minute mark. The first three items are crucial, especially when thinking about that orb prime fight and being ready for these full 5v5 team fights and being set up for that process. So keep in the back of your mind that those first three items, you really need to be ready for team fighting at that point. And then the last two items are kind of rounding out either weaknesses in your build or continuing to ramp up damages or additional defensive resources, etc. But keep those in mind, those first three items are absolutely crucial to, to make sure that you're getting what you need out of them. Now, time to kill. This is something else you want to keep in mind, and it's not the speed of it. I know there's some, some questions around whether it is too quick and everything like that, and I kind of addressed that in the last video. But really what I want to get at here is that MOBAs, for, as an industry standard, defensive resources buy you seconds you still have to do something with those seconds no matter how quick or how short time to kill is any defensive layer you buy is going to buy you a few seconds the more defensive layers you get the more seconds you buy and it's up to you then to use that time wisely and effectively just keep that in the back of your mind that you can't as even as a full tank jump into the enemy team and just expect to be able to stand there and live you have to actually make the time that you have worthwhile and then lastly you want to build for every game circumstances so there's going to be a lot of cases where you need to build anti-heal where you need maybe a different kind of defensive resource where you need a different damage resource, where you need a different amount of penetration, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of situational items, as you saw on that build sheet, a lot of different things that you can kind of keep in the back of your mind based on the game state, whether or not you're ahead, you're behind, et cetera. Just try and adjust, you know, especially if you're struggling with builds and everything like that and you don't know, you can take those recommended builds and then just make small adjustments here and there in the games based on like, oh, you, I think I might want this. See how it feels. Talk to other people about it. Ask me questions. Again, comments, Discord, blah, blah, blah. So make sure that you are adjusting these example builds to what is actually needed in the game itself. Because no game, no build, you aren't going to be able to take a build into every single game and have the same level of success, especially once you reach a certain level of play and people are pushing advantages more effectively. They are building for those specific circumstances more often. So it becomes more difficult to take one build into every single game and actually, ha again, have that same level of success. So as you're starting out, just keep that in the back of your mind. They you need to make adjustments. All right, so I put this together as a way to explain really briefly 
what all of these different things mean, how I've put these this visual information together so that you can understand it. So we're going to have our core items, and we saw this in that spreadsheet as well. This, for most builds, these are going to be the items that you're going to be building because they enable the character to do what they want to do for that particular role most effectively. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to build every single one of them in every single build. You'll see that even in the examples in the spreadsheet, or sometimes I deviate from that, or sometimes there's some theoretical builds that don't include any of the core items. So just because these are core, they're really, really effective. They're typically at the moment feeling the most impactful after you build each one of them. That's what we're going off with there. And then your situational items, this is where you can get a lot of your anti-heal, your personal preference items in terms of you know, maybe adjusting how you're dealing damage or how you're building defensive resources, things like that. And then the crests, these are the crest options that I think are the best for that particular character for that role. Now, again, there's a lot of notes in the spreadsheet about crests and everything. So, two, with all of this, I'm as we're going through these examples, I'm not actually going to talk a lot about those three boxes. What I'm going to focus on is the example build, just for the sake of making this video not, you know, three hours long. We're going to go through an example build for the character, and then again, you can get more information um, in the spreadsheet on different ways that you can do it. Some of these example builds will be the more wacky ones. They might not be the recommended build and everything like that. They're things that I've been playing, that I've been testing, that I've been having fun with. So just keep that in the back of your mind too, that if you're looking for just kind of the straight, more meta builds, I say that, uh, I say meta with a grain of salt because again, limited information as we mentioned and everything like that. But if you want the more recommended build, the one that is going to have that kind of jack of all trades and everything like that, again, refer to the spreadsheet and you'll be in good shape. So with that, let's dive into our first hero. So with these, we're very briefly going to go over some of the key elements of the kits. I'm not going to read every single ability and everything like that, just kind of key highlights so that we can understand what we're doing as we approach these builds. So Drongo, he is crit based through and through. It is his abilities deal more damage based on the amount of critical strike chance you have. And then both his abilities and his critical strikes apply a bleed. So there's a few different ways that you can do this. You can lean more ability-based, you can lean into more into attack speed, but that's kind of what you're going to keep in the back of mind, that you don't necessarily need a lot of raw power, because as you can see, his scaling is not that great, but you can lean into applying that bleed consistently, using your abilities more often, and or you can lean into maximizing kind of the rad rounds with attack speed and everything like that. So, build itself for Drongo that I have put together. It's going to be a really fun build. This one is not the recommended build, but it has been very effective for me so far. So, as we're going through these, what we're going to do is pull this up. I'll have the items. Credit to junglecamps.xyz and Noxious for putting this together. I'll put a link in the description to that website. Great resource so you don't have to get into the game to look at the items. If you find mistakes or anything like that, you can send that information to him. He's been excellent about updating and making adjustments as needed. So again, big shout out there. All right, so for this example build, it is a more ability focused build. We're gonna start with a pacifier. Now this is purely because ADCs, even though Drongo has a little bit of safety with his ultimate, Pacifier gives you a lot of flexibility in how you position, how you reposition, and two, you can use it aggressively as well, both offensively and defensively, and it's kind of my default choice for all of the ADCs in part because of that. Now, the second item here, Ashbringer, we'll get this. Oop. So, what this is, again, this is an ability-based build. We're focusing on some cooldown reduction, critical strikes, reducing our cooldowns. Excellent, you can't go wrong with this, right? Now, for basically all of the ADCs, you are going to want some sort of lifesteal for them so that they can have some survivability and everything like that. Mutilator, in this case, is a great option. 
Now with this, it doesn't trigger off of his passive bleed or anything like that, but it's a good percent health damage. It also gives you a percentage of your opponent's health. It's, again, an extra kind of defensive layer while also being very, very aggressive at the same time. It's a great combination of the two. Getting to do both at the same time feels good. And it leans into the percent damage that's already in the kit as well. We have that in his passive. We're getting more of it here. It's kind of just a nice, nice set of things that you can have. Now, again, continuing with that idea of wanting cooldown reduction and everything like that, along with a damage amplifier for your critical strikes, Viper is great. So, for a lot of characters, building up Corrode takes time. But for a character like Drongo, where your right click can hit more than once, you can stack this up relatively quickly. Now, it does not stack off your passive just so you know. But once it is stacked, you're dealing bonus critical strike damage, which is great. Again, he's a very crit-focused character. But really, the reduction in armor is also just massive. With Ashbringer, we are ignoring part of their physical defense already. And then with Viper, we are taking more of that away. So as the game progresses and as more of those things get built up, you can actually, you know, chew through those really really tough and durable opponents and then we're going into an imperator this is a huge damage spike for any any crit build so we're getting a bunch of physical power we're building it here at 80 percent crit um i'm realizing that this build only has 80 percent crit all right we'll get to that in just a second but again it's another damage amplifier for your critical strikes you're getting a bunch of power as we mentioned, his scaling isn't insane in terms of his abilities, but honestly, if you're building crit, most of the time there's no reason not to build Imperator. Now, originally when I was putting these together, a lot of the times I was slotting in Mesmer into that final slot. Uh, now, for Drongo, what I would actually probably do is put in Absolution to round out our crit chance most of the builds you will have one slot that is available for a non-crit item in order to be at a hundred percent crit rate assuming that you went with the marksman crest i kind of forgot that we had taken that up with mutilator here so i actually recommend absolution in this slot it's going to do something very similar where you're going to have cc cleanse it's not giving you that kind of initial safety or safety from hope from mages and things like that, but it's giving us a nice boost in attack speed, rounding out our critical strike chance and everything like that. Compared to Drongo, Murdoch has absolutely insane physical power scaling. So as we can see, his right click, 162% physical power scaling at max level. Static Trap, Simpack, both 100% physical power scaling, and his ultimate, 110% physical power scaling. This is, this is crazy. So Murdoch loves power. And that's really what we're going to lean on in a lot of our builds and make some small adjustments away from perhaps kind of the recommended ADC build and everything like that to focus on pushing this aspect so you can get the most out of his kit. So as we jump into our example build, as you can see, our core items are going to be these huge power items. Our situational items are, for the most part, going to be these huge power items. But let's go ahead and jump in to our example build. Let me get this pulled up again. So as we take a look here, we're going to start out the Eviscerator. So this particular build doesn't have a ton of attack speed in it. It has some stacking up with Dust Devil and everything like that. So if you can afford to not have the defensive layer of Pacifier, Eviscerator can do a ton. Especially because Eviscerator scales off of your physical power as well. So again, the damage that you're getting, it all just kind of comes together nicely building these really, really high power items. Oops. Uh, so we are then going to have Dust Devil. So this is, again, since we aren't building a lot of attack speed inside of his build, 
Duskevel is going to give us some of that. It's going to give us a little bit of ramping movement speed as well. And again, bonus physical power if we get to those six stacks. Honestly, it's probably not going to happen that often, but when it does, you will definitely notice. And movement speed for Murdoch is also excellent because he's great at kiting opponents. He can make a lot of space between himself and another opponent. Whether it's melee, whether it's ranged, or whatever, the movement speed here really helps you to push that even a little bit further. And then as I mentioned, for ADCs, we're going to have some sort of lifesteal. Terminus has been excellent for me. So the shielding, admittedly, uh, maybe okay. It, it's okay. <laughs> the excess healing as shield is useful, nothing insane, but just the fact that it has the baseline 15% lifesteal, a huge amount of physical power on it, and then it's helping us round out our critical strike chance. Now, Imperator, for every crit build, this is going to be a massive spike, and especially for Murdoch, we're getting extra power. So this item is going to give us a ton of power once everything is actually has actually come together. And so, again, high power items, crit chance, can't really go wrong there. And then this was kind of a more unique item that I've really liked on Murdoch in particular. There's been some really fun builds I've been playing with. Um, but that is the Demon Edge, as soon as I can actually find it here. <laughs> that's the only problem is there's not uh, an actual search filter in this website, but that's okay. So, Demon Edge. This again is ramping up our... We're gaining 15% bonus physical power while we're above... 40% max HP. So, especially for a lot of times your ultimates, for when you're starting a fight with that first shot you're getting with your passive and everything, great for being able to just, again, more and more and more power. And then when he falls below that health threshold, that 40% threshold, you're getting the Omnivamp. So, this is going to jump us up to 25%. Lifesteal, which is a lot. If people aren't building, um, if people aren't building the anti-heal, you may they may have some difficulties killing you. And especially since you have a lot of burst damage in your right click, that can also give you a quick burst of healing with that damage when you fall below that point. Between this, your stim pack, and everything else, you have a ton of survivability. And then we're gonna push that even further to round out the build by going into Kingsbane. Now, this for me is definitely a flex slot. You could go for an absolution here if you're really struggling with getting out of CC chains. And obviously there's a lot of other example items if you need more percent health damage and things like that. But Kingsbane is just a great way to be able to brawl. You can, it improves your 1v1 against the enemy ADC. It gives you a lot more durability. Again, that takedowns, giving you this massive shield based on physical power it's also just a high physical power item on its own and this can definitely add a lot to the build itself all right now we have sparrow sparrow is great she leans really heavily on attack speed you can see she also actually has some pretty decent physical power scaling in her kit and you can definitely lean into that. You can even have a kind of more ability-based build if you want. But really, the Relentless part, or her passive, Relentless, is what I think, and her ultimate, really kind of push the character to being strong. So your basic attacks, apply a stack of Relentless. For every stack, your basic attack then deals additional percent of your opponent's max health as bonus on hit damage. So, with the Sparrow, you really want to lean it very heavily into attack speed. This will allow you to get a lot out of inner fire as well. Now, granted, we are getting some attack speed, a lot of attack speed actually, from her passive. So, again, that heavier power build is certainly viable. But just as a baseline for when Heightened Senses is down, or just even for pushing it even further and kind of reaching that attack speed cap, which I'm not sure what that is, but... Again, more information on that in the future. But again, leaning really heavily into attack speed is going to do a lot for you. Leaning into those on-hit effects is 
going to provide just a ton of power for Sparrow overall and generally the direction that you want to go. So with Sparrow, as I mentioned, we're leaning into attack speed, and this example build in particular is definitely pushing that. So we're going to start with the pacifier. Again, Sparrow in particular doesn't have really any defensive resources and pacifier. I highly recommend it because being able to reposition in fights without your blink, being able to create distance, it's something she can't do as a part of her kit. And it get, makes the game just a little bit more forgiving to have this extra resource. All right, and then as we go into our first item here, Skyfall, this is going to give us another really nice on-hit effect that is going to make up for the fact that there's not as much power in this build necessarily. So again, we're getting that on-hit effect. We're getting our lifesteal. We're getting some healing as well. So there's a little bit of both coming from this item. And then it's just going to help us take down those tanky targets as well. Again, on-hit damage is something we really want to focus in on. Stormbreaker, since we're putting in so much attack speed, getting this set of AoE damage on top of your ultimate and everything like that and your Hail of Arrows, it's, it's just going to do a lot inside of those big team fights. But even just for wave clear and speeding up your farming process, Stormbreaker does a lot, actually. And again, if you're leaning into attack speed, it's a great option to kind of round that out and help accelerate getting to some of your other key power spikes. Imperator, for basically all of your crit builds, this is nuts. It's giving you extra power. It's making your critical strikes stronger. Definitely something that you want to keep in mind for any crit builds. It's also, I think, the highest physical power item in the game, just as a baseline. Uh, especially then you're adding the physical power that you're getting from the uh, passive of perfection. There's no reason not to build this if you're building crit. I'm going to just say that. <laughs> Dust Devil. So again, we're really pushing that attack speed aspect as hard as we can. Now, some of this might be inefficient, again, because I don't know exactly what the attack speed cap is. But it's all felt good when I have built it. Again, that's kind of just a personal feeling and everything. I don't have the math behind it yet. But, you know, keep in mind that there may see some inefficiency there. But so far, Dust Devil, again, we're using the movement speed here because Sparrow doesn't have a ton inside of her kit. We're getting a little bit from this. And from Stormbreaker, we're getting some baseline movement speed just to help. And then Dust Devil is pushing that a little bit further. She's really, since we're leaning so heavy, heavily into that attack speed, at this point we're at 100% crit chance. So we're going to get that ramp up to the extra like 10% movement speed relatively quickly. It's a layer of safety and a way to help you keep on top of opponents. It just makes your life a little bit easier. And then rounding it out with Mesmer, which is going to give us, let me get it pulled up here. This is going to give us just that nice spell shield. This is a defensive resource, some magical armor. A lot of those times as an ADC, the, the, the person that you are struggling with is the poke from an opposing mage. So they hit you with a stray ability, you take a bunch of damage, and then the jungler can come in and wreck your face. Mesmer is just giving you a little bit of a defensive layer around either the against either the initiation from some sort of key piece of CC that you can block, or again, that one stray ability that can buy you a little bit of time to deal more damage. Because again, we're all about the DPS on these ADCs, so buying that extra little bit of time can make a huge difference. All right, next up is Decker. So we're starting to get into some of our characters that have a lot more flexibility in their roles as you can see so decker the interesting thing about her she doesn't have a ton of scaling inside of her kit it's really going to be about using stasis bomb and containment fence and ion strike to control space you're really really good at stopping opponents from getting to where they want to go and if you think about it that way we're going to really lean into a lot of cooldown reduction so that we can keep doing that consistently. We're also going to lean into some durability because Containment Fence is very short cast range. 
And even your ultimate isn't that long of a cast range. So you do often have to be kind of in the middle or at least closer to the opponents than some of the other uh, range CC effects. Now, obviously, Stasis Bomb, very long range. So you've got a little bit of, of flexibility there and you can use that to be able to get close the gap and everything. But just something to keep in mind, the Containment Defense and Ion Strike, you do have to be closer to the fight than maybe is comfortable without some of those defensive resources. So first off, we have our Decker support build. So Decker as a support, ton of excellent options, very, very flexible character. And I really want to stress in this particular case that this example build is not the only way to do it, but Time Warp in particular is extremely strong. And I will say that you should probably be building that basically every time. But especially in terms of Crest, you have great options for both Consort and Guardian. You can build Health on her, so Sanctification is solid. Riftwalkers is great. Tranquility gives you a ton of options. Or it, it, blah. That extra layer of defense, especially with the healing and then the damage reduction part of it in particular. Um, but let's go ahead and go through this example build real quick. So Silentium, first item. Now we put this here specifically because I wanted to highlight that this item is great for stopping opponent ultimates. So Gideon ultimate, if his true silver is broken, um, Richter ultimate, Howie ultimate. There are a lot of things that you can interrupt with this item, assuming that you can get in range. The range is kind of medium, uh, which is good. I think it's a very good, well-designed item for that in that regard. But you want to keep in mind that you have to, you know, really have to be kind of quick on the trigger finger for that. But it can help you get out of some of those key abilities. Or even if just an opponent jumps in, like a Chimera or something like that, it can buy time before he can get his ultimate off. So he can't burst someone down as quickly and everything like that. Now for our first actual item here, we want to go into... I've been staring at this for so long. All right, we're going to go into Time Warp. And really what this does is it's going to allow us to cycle the Containment Fence and Stasis Bomb more frequently. And especially with the stun, it's really important. This is what's going to allow us to really spam our abilities even more than we would be anyway. Um, and then the next one that we're going to go into, Hexbron Bracers, as I mentioned in her kit review, we want some defensive layers. Hexbound Bracers is a great way to help with the mana sustain so that you can really push that time warp aspect. And time warp is getting us some mana regen, but you're going to want more <laughs> most of the time. And Hexbound Bracers is just a great way to actually get that, to really pull some extra cooldown reduction in to get that mana regen. And especially since we are do already have some mana regen, we're going to have that bonus ability haste here. 35 ability haste is a lot. I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, it's the highest you can get on a single item in the game. I might be wrong there, though. Um, but it's a lot. Definitely a potent item to build into. Now, Vanguardian, this is an item that it's just a great resource for getting your baseline magical protections. And for protections, most of the time you will want some magical and then a bunch of physical that's how it, that's been the most successful for me by far and vanguardian does a nice thing where it gives you both where it gives you that that magical armor and then when you're taking damage you get magical and physical protections so really nice little item to have that also then gives your allies just a little bit of extra defensives Especially since you can play at that medium range, and it's easier to give your ADC, your mid lane, so your range characters that extra layer of defense that it may not be doing a ton, but it's there, it's helpful, it's worth having. Now Dynamo, this is an item you're going to see a lot on these support characters because it is awesome to be able to shred an opponent's physical and magical armor. The fact that it does both feels very good on a lot of different characters. And it's really how you can help ramp up your allies' damage toward the end game. So that, you know, you hit that stun on an opponent, 
and you get that shred off, it feels like you can then take a big rampage down who's on your your carry. You can help actually mitigate some of the the dive potential, particularly from the offlaners and everything like that. So again, Dynamo is a great resource. And then finally, we're going to round out the build with Requiem. Now, this is a very unique item, and I like it, but it's giving you magical power, which is great. We're not really using the heal and shield power, but that's fine. It's kind of an extra stat. The magic power we're getting, the health we're getting, the mana regen once again, so that we can have Hexbound up as often as possible. Fantastic. And then you're also granting nearby allies this physical power and lifesteal aspect, which Great if you can be near your junglers, great if you can be near your ADC. Doesn't do a lot for your magical, like, mid laners or solo laners, things like that, but that's okay. It does enough on its own, especially just pumping up the ADC and giving that, them that extra durability. Especially if you see your ADC building into a more brawler-style build with the King's Ban and, uh, you know, Terminus, Sky Splitter, those kinds of things, if they're stacking multiples of those. Requiem is a great pickup to give even more sustain and lifesteal and shielding and everything for those allies. Next up, Decker Offlane. So this is a little bit different because we want to have some damage in our kit. We want to be able to box with our lane opponent, especially early on. But we also still want to have enough durability that we can... You know, even though we're adding damage into our fights in later stages in the game, we also want to make sure that we can still survive when we get ganked, when we, you know, go in to initiate a fight and things like that. Because oftentimes with our solo laners, we are going to be still pushing to be an initiator and things like that. Not always. It depends on what your jungler is, what your support is, how they're building and everything. But it gives you some more flexibility if you just have those tools available to you. So, for the example build here, we're going to start with the Typhoon. Decker does a lot with attack speed, actually. If you can land even just a mid-range stun, you can get in a lot of hits. And Typhoon is going to also, when you're at those max stacks, granted, not the easiest to stay at max stacks in those cute moments, but it gives you that dash, which is, again, my as we talked about with some of the ADCs, it's a nice defensive resource. The fact that it's not always up is a little... Eh, but that's okay. It also gives us ramping attack speed, which is nice. And overall, it's just... Occult Crest is a great resource to have in the early laning stage. Although, obviously, there are other options, even as I put in here. So, then, for our first actual item... We're going to go into Leviathan. Now, the reason we're going into this is mostly for the fact that we're getting ability haste based on the amount of HP that we have. Again, Decker, absolutely fantastic the more that you can spam out these abilities. Now, one thing I want to mention with Leviathan, and I've made this note on every, every page of the sheet that has Leviathan, you want to build Lockshawl first. Then you're going to finish your next two items, usually, and come back and finish Leviathan. And the reason for that is you're going to want to start stacking this, but until you get close to stacked, there's not a whole lot of reason to go in and upgrade this. You'll just get a little bit more value out of going into your subsequent items and coming back when it's closer to stacked. So, with that, uh, Prophecy... So this is going to be our main damage tool as a soul laner. Great if you are, especially if you are in a melee matchup where you can sit there and poke. But even like I said, if you land that mid-range stun, gives you that extra attack power. This helps a ton with your wave clear as well, so you aren't reliant on just your one and then really weak auto attacks and everything like that. Especially in the early stages, since your your clear your cooldowns are a little bit long, prophecy really allows us to help speed all of that up significantly. 
And then our next item, Golem's Gift. This is a really unique effect that's kind of cool and oops, wrong set of things to look at here. Golem's Gift. So this is giving us a ton of power. One, I mean, baseline 70 magic power. This is a lot. Now, granted, you know, we don't have a ton of scaling for it. We have a little bit off Prophecy. We've got like 50% on all of our abilities and everything like that. But even as a baseline, at the very start, you are getting 70 magical armor and 110 magical power from this. Now, every physical hit is going to reduce that. Physical hit from heroes, specifically, is going to reduce that. But even just that baseline starting point is going to let you do a lot of damage from range as melee opponents try to close the gap. To be able to go in and have a high amount of burst off, like, ultimate into the straight line ability with your auto attacks and everything again you're ramping up the damage from prophecy too because it has a little bit of that percent of magic power scaling on it so just keep that in mind that like golem's gift it's just giving you a nice layer of defensive resources it's giving you some ability haste again we're leaning into that like mad and then we're getting this massive amount of any at least initial physical armor that can buy you time if nothing else you know, yes, you take those four shots, you have to get out of combat in order to reset it and everything. But still, for those shots, you have a massive amount of physical armor to lean on to help you actually survive it. Now, for our magical armor, I went for a more offensive choice here, specifically because, again, off solo lane, you really do want to have, most of the time, a little bit of damage potential. And because our baseline damage isn't that great, we're leaning a little heavier into these more hybrid items rather than the full tank items. But you can obviously go one direction or the other. Now, Spellbreaker, it's giving us some magic defense. It's giving us that spell shield. Just buying us some different ways to... Um, to approach team fights so that we can get in range so we aren't stopped before we can get in range of a key ultimate or you know if that stun setup doesn't quite work out or you get wrapped on or something like that it buys you time to be able to jump out something along those lines right and then finally rounding this out with a little bit more of a team oriented buff in the marshal so this it's a solid item since we're building the attack speed anyway. It's giving us some, just on our own, some more on-hit damage. But then also, you're just giving that boost to your allies so that, again, some late-game scaling for everyone, basically, for your whole team. Definitely a flex slot where you can build into more um, physical armor if you need it. You can build into a little more health if you need it, although be careful with that. Just because stacking health, even though there's a lot of characters that want to do it, and here we're even buying Leviathan, there's a lot of percent health damage in the game. So it may not be as valuable as building, say, a Warden's Faith or something along those lines. But rounding that out again, kind of a more aggressive option in the Marshal, just to give us some late game scaling for both us and our allies. All right, and then last but not least for Decker, we have Decker mid. So Decker, even though she doesn't have a ton of scaling in her kit and everything, you actually have, with the attack speed build, quite a bit that you can do in rel relatively short periods of time. Now, I will say it's difficult to pull off. Your wave clear in the beginning is not great. You can definitely have some struggles with poke and everything like that. And you are very susceptible to ganks before your your like level three spike in particular, where you can have both ball and cage. Although to be fair, depending on how you're leveling abilities, maybe even that level four spike. So just pay attention in your laning phase and everything like that, so that you aren't uh, you don't become exploited by the enemy team because it definitely can happen, and it's something that you have to kind of keep in the back of your mind. But all right, so first off here, starting with Typhoon. Let me get this pulled up. So Typhoon, this is going to give us that ramping attack speed. It's going to give us that dash at least sometimes. 
So you really do have to make sure that you're getting your auto attacks off in team fights that you are, you know, stun, auto, auto one or whatever, like making sure that you're getting those auto attacks in to really maximize your ability to, to have safety. You have a lot of it in your kit, don't get me wrong, but if you get jumped, this dash can definitely save your life. So our first item, Prophecy, it's going to give us bonus wave. It's going to speed up our wave clear quite a bit, just because our auto attacks are going to do a lot more. Again, in those early stages, your cooldowns are a little bit long. So it's going to help us with that significantly, as well as just giving us a lot of damage to be able to trade. Everyone's cooldowns are relatively long in the early stages. Now, granted, first item, we're starting to get to that midway point on, on our ability, on our first ability and everything. And so you will find that, like, taking extended trades with this, but even just the components, you can really do a lot. And then we're going to go into Magnify. This is, again, giving us a little bit more attack speed, and then every attack that we have is going to reduce their magical armor. So if you can land stun, land a couple of auto attacks, and then hit your line or hit your ultimate into an auto attack and a line or something like that, you can really do a ton of burst damage while like while playing around that stun now with most magical power builds we're going to be building caustica just because this is where we're going to get a lot of our penetration and then also mana sustain is especially in the later stages of the game when you're not as consistently getting river buffs and things like that it's really important for those late game sieges and everything just to give you more options so you can stay longer so you can fight longer so that you can well, just do more in any given fight. So just keep that in the back of your mind that this is a really, really effective tool for both the, that for both of those aspects. Spellbreaker, we're rounding this out with just a nice defensive layer spell shield to be able to help you both because you have to get into that mid range, like we were talking about in her hero kit. Getting in range can be a problem if you're hit by a stray stun, if you're hit by a stray ability, you might get poked out even before you can really get in and do stuff. So, Spellbreaker, even just making it harder for opponents to start fights on you, can do a lot, given how much control you have in your kit. Even out of mid lane, even though you're squishy, you can still do a lot. And then rounding out the build in this case, I went with Megacosm, just because it's giving us that percent health damage. You have a decent sequence where you can hit three abilities in a row pretty consistently. That's going to do a big chunk of that percent health damage. And even with that, at this point in the build, we've got a little bit of ability haste and everything like that. We're, we're hitting often enough that it can help take down some of those beefier targets. This is definitely something where I would... You could replace with a Tainted Scepter. You could be cheeky and go with the Ella Frost. You could go with the heavier burst item in Oathkeeper or an Astral Catalyst to be able to use your ultimate more often. That one is definitely, there's an argument for that, that it should just be in this build. But again, since it's a more attack speed oriented one, if you're going to go for a more burst oriented, Astral is definitely your default for all of them, as we will definitely see a little bit later on. Next up, our boy Narbash. So... Really, the key thing to keep in mind with Narbash, there's not a lot of magical power scaling, there's a little bit, but his kit really revolves around using his passive, the beat drop, to have some mana sustain, but we're going to need more. He is very mana hungry. And then also using that rhythm to be able to reduce the cooldown of Thunk. And again, stacking this with a bunch of ability haste and everything like that, we can get to very short cooldowns on Thunk, even though it has a relatively high base cooldown. So just something you want to keep in the mind. And then two, with Crash Bang Boom, you are very vulnerable in this ultimate. So you'll see in both of these builds that we're going to be building the True Silver Amulet. We're going to be focusing a lot of health so that we can actually use this ult without as much worry. There's still some, because obviously if that shield is broken before the ult finishes, you can still be stopped and everything like that. But keep that in the back of your mind. that you are, Even though you aren't going to be taking as much damage during the ultimate, getting your ultimate stopped can put you in a very vulnerable position. And you really just want to keep that in the back of your mind when building Narbash. The Narbash support. 
he is an excellent engaged support and for this example build we're leaning into that in particular of going into the rift walkers so that you can close the gap so that you can do more in terms and have more flexibility in how you use your ultimate and everything like that and the focus of the build is really on trying to survive and make your ult do as much as possible while also incorporating a little bit of that heal power so that we can really amp up uh, especially our late game siege potential so let's jump in here like i said rift walkers oops we are going into these so that we can jump in close the gap have another way to either close the gap for a thunk or for your ultimate and really pull people in for a big ultimate to be able to go off. Hexbound Bracers with these, we are... Da, 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 da. That's fine. Uh, well, this is how we're getting all of our mana sustain. Wonderful first item on Narbash. The cooldown aspect of it is certainly valuable. Um, not necessarily the most important part of it, though. That mana sustain is really important. Even in just in early stages, being able to offer your team the ability to stay on the map after maybe you take a bad trade or something like that, or the opponent catches you off guard, right? If you can get out of that situation and say maybe you're a third health, half health, but you have the mana to heal up your, your nearby allies, it makes all the difference in the world. Plus, again, physical armor, so it's give, helping us be able to stand in front of our opponents, which definitely important in this particular case because, well, we want to be able to do that. Second, we're going to True Silver. You'll see this, again, as I mentioned, very, very important item. So we are building a little bit of health toward later in the build to give us an even larger shield, so we have more CC immunity during that ultimate i'm really just trying to push what we can get at, at as early as possible from that ability now tainted totem this one we're going into in part for the aoe slow around you so this is really going to help if there are opponents who want to engage on top of you who want to because a lot of times as narbash you can kind of play at a midpoint and then either use the Rift Walkers to get in or use your, your March to be able to get yourself closer in. And then, of course, the bonus healing and shielding. Again, very sustain oriented build. It's going to do a lot for us. Vanguardian, this is great because not only, again, are we helping to support our allies to keep them alive, but we're also making sure that when we stand in the middle of the fight, we are getting a boost in that physical armor which we're definitely otherwise lacking just a little bit normally you would like to have another piece of that somewhere in here and then in this particular case i went ahead and chose to round out the build with requiem now obviously that for me this is very much the flex slot in this build where you can go into a lot of different things but it's more heal and shield power the like I said, there's not a ton of magical power scaling in Narbesh's kit, but there is some even for the healing. But the other kind of key component to this is the 10% base mana regen. So we're getting base mana regen from this. Uh, we're getting a little bit from True Silver. And so between that and the Hexbound in those late stage uh, sieges and everything like that, you can stay there, you can keep your allies healed up, and still not have to worry about running out of mana for Thunk, or for being able to march your opponent or your allies away, and everything like that. So just a nice way to kind of round out the build. Now, Narbash offlane is very similar. As you can see, our core items didn't change a ton between the two. We're still going to go to the X-Brown, we're still going to lean on the True Silver, Tainted Tone of is still fantastic. It's how we want to get our anti-heal. And also, again, slowing enemies around you is very strong. Now, some of the things that you can do here, you can lean into a Leviathan for more cooldown reduction and more base health. You can also just go with this example build. So as we're jumping into this, let's take a look. All right, so first up, we've got Tempest. Now, this is, a again, so solo laners, I really like to have a little bit of damage 
in the kit. And Tempest is going to give you some baseline. It's also going to give you some healing in there for when you go in, you ultimate, you become the point of focus for your opponents. It's going to give you just a little bit of extra durability, a little bit of extra sustain, while also still giving you a more offensive laning stage and everything like that. Hexbound, this is a crucial item for Narbash. Uh, you know, went through it with that support build. Just absolutely phenomenal for keeping your mana up, for giving us that physical armor that we really need, and even just giving us cooldown reduction when we're above that point. But admittedly, the, the mana on hit, the return on hit, is what is absolutely phenomenal here. True Silver Bracelet. The nice thing about building Leviathan in this on out of the offlane is that you really push the True Silver Bracelet shield. So that's one, some, one thing you want to kind of keep in the back of your mind, that you can go into this they're going to leviathan as a way to push this if the enemy has a lot of cc such as a richter even just by itself right so keep that in the back of your mind as for why you might want to build a leviathan but true silver cc immunity during your ult plus some shield that is giving you a massive amount of durability between that and the damage mitigation that you get while your ult is active tainted totem boosts your healing slowing it enemies around you, base mana regen, what's not to love. And then we're going to go into some more physical armor. Here I decided to go for the Frost Guard. Again, you are going to be the focus, especially during your ultimate a lot of the time. So slowing down ADC attack speed, slowing down attack speed of junglers who are more focused on that and everything. This may not be right in every single game. You can certainly go into a Fire Blossom earlier on to have the extra clear and everything like that. There's a lot of different wiggle room here, but it was just a kind of a fun and different option that it works really well on Narbash that I thought I would throw it in there. And then to round out our magical, or sorry, to round out our build, going into an Unbroken Will if they have a lot of CC so that as you're walking at your opponents, you know, here without the Rift Walkers and everything, you don't have the same gap close that you do as a, as a support. So you really have to walk at your opponents. You have, this just gives you more wiggle room in before you get your ult off, before you get that shield, or even after it's finished and that shield is, is gone, or even Again, if they break that shield and then CC you out of your ultimate, you're still getting decreased damage so that you're not just blown up in that instance. You might still die, but you'll at least have by yourself some extra time. And then the sustain goes a long, a long way, especially with his natural healing inside of his kit. Next up is Muriel. So this is our kind of traditional... I'm going to shield my allies and try and keep them alive support. Admittedly, at the moment, feels a little weak, but hopefully we'll see some, some tuning come through for that. But regardless, there's definitely a lot that we can, we can take away from this. So, first off, magical power scaling, very, very low, but you are getting it for your shields, so it is something that you want to, you kind of do want to lean into, and you're also getting a little bit in your passive as well, which is nice. So, really, there's kind of a couple of different ways that you can go, especially since you're getting a massive shield from your ultimate. You can lean more heavily into the magical power and being able to stay really far away from fights, or you know, stand even maybe behind your ADC type of thing. Or you can lean into kind of a more defensive approach so that when you ult in, you don't just immediately die. All right, so Muriel support. So the build that I really want to showcase here is a more tempo-oriented build. The power of Muriel really comes from being able to push the early laning phase with the bonus damage that you have from your passive. And so this build is really going to try and take that and, and run with it. So starting off here, we're, I, I went with Malediction kind of just because. You can definitely go Silentium, you can definitely go Tranquility, but for this build in particular, you want to be able to go with the Consort so that you have the bonus damage and everything like that. Again, we're pushing the tempo as fast, like, to make it our laning stage and everything and to push as fast as we possibly can for advantages. 
Malediction is really nice in that regard because when you are using it offensively against the enemy ADC, against the opposing jungler, if you are the ones running at the opponent, Malediction is excellent for being able to make sure that you actually can do that. So then going into Marshall, this is just a really nice setup that is going to give um, bonus attack speed in the early stages, which is something that all ADCs are lacking. And so we're trying to help kind of bolster that, ramp up their damage quickly. And then again, we're getting a little bit more stacking magic damage between the passive and Marshall. So it's just a lot of bonus damage early in the game. So again, if you're pushing that tempo and you manage to get this item relatively early, you can apply a lot of pressure to your opponents, either forcing them out of lane, forcing them to use a lot of potions and things like that. And that's where Muriel shines, is when you can you can take and push that as far as or as fast as you possibly can. Next up is Time Warp. You're gonna see this item a lot on our supports because using your abilities more often. Since, especially since we don't have more active items, we are going to rely very heavily on our kit. Time warp, little bit of power, a lot of, a little bit of ability haste on its own, and then obviously resetting your cooldowns, being able to slow more often, being able to give your allies those shields, it makes a big difference for sure. And then since we are pushing this tempo so quickly, going into an early Requiem to really start Again, giving just even that little bit of physical power and everything like that. It is about building these small advantages as fast as possible so that you can really kind of try and take over your opponents before your shields and everything like that kind of fall off a cliff in terms of what they do. Crystal Tier. This is going to give us some very solid ramping power for our shields. So anytime you shield an ally, you get magical power and ability haste your ally does as well sometimes this will be relevant sometimes it won't but even just for you you're getting more health and shield power as you can see we have a lot of that throughout this build in its entirety and then it's also just giving you the ability to like your second shield is going to be extremely strong or after coming down from your ultimate in the next shield that you're laying on top, you've got 40 extra magical power for that. So you're going to get an extra 20 point shield just from just from that passive. That's a lot. It's not okay. It's not a ton. But again, adding on top of everything else that we're getting, this item in total, just the one item by itself, is giving us you know 50 bonus shield plus then multiplied by the heal and shield power percentage. It adds up quickly. And then last but not least, going into Painted Totem. And this is really just, again, ramping up that healing and shield power. Like I said, part of the problem with Muriel is that her shields tend to fall off right now in terms of effectiveness. So we're trying to help mitigate that by building as much of this as we reasonably can, while also giving us a little bit of durability so that when you ult in, you have time to be able to reposition because that's something that's really, really important for her. And another way that you can go to on more defensive builds and everything, you can go into the Rift Walkers, you can go into something along those lines that you have ability to reposition a little more effectively, or even just the Tranquility to buy you more time, which is something Tranquility fits very well in this build, just as a side note, always an option. But yeah, the core idea of the build, fast, 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 fast. Apply the pressure as much as you possibly can so that you can end the game or at least be ahead enough that your shielding and everything is allowing you to really still keep your allies alive. All right, Muriel offlane. This is actually something that I think is surprisingly strong. Now, there are some risks with it. Your early laning phase is usually pretty solid if you're in a melee matchup, but you are very vulnerable to ganks. So keep that in mind that you really need to keep your wards up. If you're doing this too, you really want to be pushing to stay on the opposite side of the map as your team. You're, you, you are responsible in this case for controlling and managing your waves so that you can ult into those key, key team fights use the defensive resources that you have to be able to reposition after your ultimate and then add extra damage to the fight itself 
So let's take a look at the example build here. We are going into first up Typhoon. Now this, there are a lot of different options here and Epoch is probably a slightly better defensive resource that can again really help buy you time for cooldowns in those team fights after you ult in and everything like that or even just buy time as you get jumped when you are in on the other side of the map so that your your team can do more because they have more time to react they have more time to get to an objective somewhere else etc but typhoon the nice thing about it is that it's giving you just more damage in your 1v1 matchup and everything. And we are really leaning into that in, in how you can kind of fight those melee heroes and and punish them for, for difficulties getting in range. This is great in particular against something like a Richter if he misses his hook, or a Grux where his, you know, you can kind of stay at a medium range from his dash if he doesn't hit his pull. But even with those, obviously, you are vulnerable to some of those aspects. And that's just something you have to keep in mind, that this is a very... You are walking a very narrow line with playing Muriel solo. But our first item is going to help with that a little bit, where we're going into... We're going to build the Lock Shawl, then we're going to be the Tier 2 of this, then we're going to build our next two items, and then we're going to come back and finish up Leviathan. Leviathan, max health, cooldown reduction absolutely great i should start calling it ability haste i apologize max health ability haste you can't go wrong with this especially since later on that max health is really going to help with our true silver bracelet and buying time when you ult into fights now our first actual item here we are so you have some really solid trading potential in the early levels because of your passive and your ability to kind of manipulate the wave and everything like that. And so we're going to push that even further by going into Prophecy. This is giving us that bonus on hit magic damage so that you can really kind of tear through an opponent rather quickly and just help with your wave clear. Your wave clear, your Q, does go through waves, so that part is great. But there's still only so much that can do, and you also don't really want to be shielding to, like, break the wave and things like that those defensive resources you need them so prophecy is going to help with the wave clear and everything like that so that you can be more sparing with your abilities you don't have to worry as much about mana constraints and everything like that and the next step again we're just pushing that even further going into a magnify this is going to ramp up the damage from prophecy from your passive from everything it, it does kind of just everything that you need it to do now, True Silver Bracelet, this is what's going to give us the survivability that we need when we ult into a fight to be able to reposition and start dealing damage. Because a lot of the times you're going to ult on top of someone and there will be enemies right there. So getting the shield, getting the CC immunity, it's going to do a lot for you so you can walk away, reposition, and start auto-attacking. And then rounding out the build, just the Tainted Totem so that you have the bonus shield and shield power. We're pushing that a little bit, especially off the ultimate, because we're building a bunch of magical power. Her ult does have good magic power scaling, so Tainted Totem is just going to give us kind of a percentage multiplier for that, and then giving us the anti-heal and the slow, so that when people do get on top of us, we have the ability to kite them a little more effectively through our shields and everything like that try and create some space even just through the movement speed that we can get through our abilities etc next up steel so he has become even just one of my favorite characters especially to play in solo lane um steel is really interesting because his passive you have percent health scaling on your passive you get a shield anytime you immobilize an enemy hero which is your bash your dash and your ultimate you have some okay magic power scaling, uh, especially in the dash and the ultimate, and your abilities are on relatively slow or relatively short cooldowns as once you get a little ways into things. So you're really your goal is just to initiate fights, to be able to jump in with your ultimate and disrupt the enemy team and and keep a key target locked down so that they can't impact the fight or so that they can be focused by your team either way 
you're you're creating zones where it is just very difficult for your opponents to do anything, and you're splitting up fights. That's maybe even the better way to think about it, because your shield, you're cutting off and forcing opponents to delay their damage to reposition, maybe to where they don't want to be. Your ultimate is forcing players to spread out more if they're thinking ahead for it, and if they ever group up, obviously you're going to have a field deck. So that's kind of how you want to think about playing Steel, is that most of the time you are just trying to divide up the opponents so that they're try they're in reality taking smaller fights, and then they're at numbers disadvantages during those time periods. But also, again, your ability to lock down a single target is a lot. You know, your ultimate, you have the knockup from your push, you can push enemies towards your allies, and then your shield bash, it may only be a half second stun, but you can interrupt key abilities, and again, half a second can do a lot. Now, for support steal, your your goal is really to stay alive yourself so that you can provide some extra bonuses to your allies and then initiate fights. That's that's your entire goal is to be able to find those good ultimates especially on the people who can dive your ADC, so their jungle and everything like that, or if your ADC is safe and everything like that, then going in and being able to follow up or set up for a more assassin-style jungler, or again, disrupting those fights, creating zones where it's just difficult for the opponents to fight into. But with all of that, you are going to be on the front lines and you really need to be very durable. So here, in this example build, I opted into a Sanctification. The re main reason for this is because you don't need a lot of gap close on Steel. You have your ultimate, you have your dash, you have the ability, even in the early stages, to dash through the wave and, and smack someone with your right click, right click, and then walk away with that shield. You just have a lot of resources to, to close that gap. So Rift Walkers, while it can be helpful, certainly a powerful tool. Sanctification is just giving you another layer of defense to add to your allies to help them survive key moments, which is really just very nice to have. Now, for our first actual item, in this case, I, I went for something dynamo that gives us both big burst of damage, but also gives us health, physical armor, a lot of physical armor right from the game. And we're going to kind of push the physical armor aspect of this build pretty hard because, again, when you ult in, similar to Narbash, you're going to often become the focus. We're going to try and punish people from that. But Dynamo, it's early burst damage. It's shred armor for later stages in the game. All around, just a solid first item. Not mandatory, but even just for the stats alone, very, very strong. So now then, as we go into our second item... This Vanguardian, is it's there for, to be able to give you some bonus prots. Again, you're jumping in to the middle of the team. You want to stay alive. But also, again, adding a defensive layer for the rest of your team. Because even though you have a lot of control, there's definitely... You don't necessarily have, offer as much in terms of survivability. No, I shouldn't say that. Your control is offering survivability, but the more that you can layer on top of that, the more of those things you can stack, the better. That's essentially what I'm getting at. Ben Guardian is just going to give another layer to your allies to be able to be in the middle of whatever fight they, are, had they happen to be in. Now, the reason that we are pushing that physical armor aspect so hard is because we're going into a Tainted Guard. Now... You can go into something like Fire Blossom or something along those lines as well over the Dynamo. I just want to mention that briefly. Um, but Tainted Guard in particular, it's a little more, like, selfish. That's why I didn't include it in the support builds. <laughs> Pardon me. Mm. Alright, Tainted Guard. This is why we are pushing that physical armor aspect as much as we can because the bleed that you apply gets ramped up by your bonus physical armor so we're really trying to punish people for make for us becoming the focus of a team fight 
And then going into Flux Matrix, we're adding some more bonus health. All of these items have health and armor, so we're just trying to be as beefy as we possibly can. Flux Matrix is also going to give us a nice damage amp for our mid laner or even for jungle or solo, depending on what type of damage profile they are. And just for ourselves, too, because, again, Steel's base damage is actually pretty decent, so ramping that up by 15 additional percent is great. And then decreasing tenacity, also, again, you have a lot of CC in your kit. Being able to have those stuns actually last as long as they're supposed to, or at least closer to it, is great. And then last but not least, rounding it out with one of the best physical armor uh, items in the game in Warden's Faith here. This is a huge chunk of health, huge chunk of physical armor, and you take reduced damage from critical strikes. You, this lets you stand in front of the opposing ADC a lot easier. Doesn't mean that you'll always be able to stand there for very long, but gives you time to get your shield wall up, gives you time to stun them and everything like that. And then when you're hit, it reduces your basic ability cooldowns. And hit steel, you can do a ton with your basic abilities. So both of the passives on this are just phenomenal to pick up as a way to round out the build. So as we look at steel offlane, we can see there's a lot of similarities here where we are trying to be super beefy. And arguably, he kind of has four core items because Fire Blossom is insane on him. Um, but... There are some other options, and you can make the argument that maybe it's even more important than Worldbreaker. And... But regardless, let's go ahead. The whole point of Seal Offlane is this is just a more aggressive version of the build. It's one that I've been running, especially these first three items feel absolutely phenomenal on him. So let's go ahead and take a look. First up, we've got our Crest Tempest. I really like going for the Occult Crest in the early stages. I think people underestimate how much sustain this actually gives you, and people also underestimate the that little bit of power, and it gives Steel a surprising amount of damage in those early trades. And then next up, with a lot of, uh, with a lot of soul laners, as you'll see, we're going to be building into. First of all, you're building into Lock Shawl. Then we're going to finish the next two items. And then we're going to come back and we're going to finish up the Leviathan. So again, we're pushing the max health on him for two reasons. One, we want to build Worldbreaker. And two, his passive, the extra shields that you're getting. It may not be a ton, but every little bit that you can add just gives you more and more survivability. Sorry, after we built the Lark Shawl, our first item, most of the time is going to be Fire Blossom. Now sometimes, depending on your matchup, you might need your magic defense first. Again, keep that in the back of your mind that you might have to shift the build order around a little bit. But Fire Blossom is just excellent. He has three different ways to immobilize targets. So you're getting a bunch of bonus damage from that aspect of it. And then we're also just stacking health. As you can see in this particular build, Every single item has health on it, which is going to pump up the what we're getting out of Worldbreaker and what we're getting out of the Fire Blossom passive. And then uh, next up, Flux Matrix. Again, bonus damage to enemies. This is great for a number of reasons. I don't think I talk Oh, Tempest itself. <laughs> Going back to the crest briefly. Tempest itself, I like that a lot. Obelisk, also technically an option, but maybe a little more aggressive than you need to be. But Tempest gives you extra sustain, and given how much health we're building, it's nice. Okay, sorry, back to Flux Matrix. So, bonus damage, reducing tenacity, just taking and making sure that your, your kit gives you... You can use your kit more effectively and really maximize every aspect of it a little more efficiently. Worldbreaker, this is where we're getting a lot of our damage, particularly from the 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 mana passive, where we're getting 2% of our max health as bonus magical power. Again, Steel, not a ton of scaling in his kit, but he combos very, very effectively, and it does add up very, very quickly. And then since we have already a really a, a decent amount of physical armor from the fire blossom we are stacking a bunch of armor or a bunch of health anyway tainted guard is a great way to round out the build dynamo can be a great way to also add in some extra burst damage and everything personally i'm just partial to tainted guard because i like the anti-heal aspect for fighting against adcs in particular as well as just making it 
giving them less time to sit there and auto attack you. So, you know, you get, you take an auto attack or two, you get your wall down, you close the gap through that. There's just a lot of ways that you can play around with it and, and make them feel uncomfortable, which even as a person who plays a lot of ADC, yeah, I, I, I like doing that to, to my opposing ADCs. <laughs> All right, and then for Steel, finally, we're going to round out by putting him in the jungle. Now, here, I definitely opted a little bit more for the burst damage aspect of the build, but you can certainly go into a full tank version, very similar to what we did in the offlane. Just keep that in the back of your mind. But this, in particular, has been working very well. Um, it Part of the struggle for Steel in the early stages is his clear. Your ability is, even though they're shorter cooldowns once you're higher levels, early stages, relatively long cooldowns, your base damage isn't massive. So what we're going to do is lean into a prophecy so that we can really ramp up our clear, go into some attack speed, and, and let's take a look here at, at what we're trying to accomplish in this example build. As I started talking about it before I even had the items pulled up. Alright, so Tempest, this again, I like the Occult Crest. You can also go into a Typhoon. Typhoon is kind of nice in being able to continue to close gaps through team fights between your combos. Um, so it just it just gives you a nice little little boost. Um, but Tempest, we are still relatively durable. As you can see, we're leaning into a lot of tank items still. Well, also working on some burst so tempest you're still going to get a lot of value out of ulting in taking a couple hits popping the tempest and and getting that bonus damage kind of spread out across the enemies and then like i said like i mentioned a couple of times already we are going to go into a prophecy so Again, the reason for this isn't necessarily because Steel does exceptionally well with attack speed, even though it's actually his base auto attack damage is not bad. But it's the best way that I have found to speed up his clear in the early stages so that you don't struggle in the mid game to both farm and move around the map. And then following that, going into our first piece of, of defenses, where we're going to have Dynamo, we are going to be doing a lot of damage anyway, just because we're leaning a little heavier into the magic power, and even some true damage down the line. Um, and so Dynamo, it also is going to give us, again, help us a little bit with that wave clear, because when you immobilize an it deals magic damage to nearby targets. That includes like some of those, uh, like the little five minion jungle camp and things like that or just shredding the armor so that your auto attacks from prophecy you can take down your buffs a little bit more quickly again speeding up your clear and then also just giving you an extra burst of damage whenever you are going and you're going into the opposing lanes and you're attacking etc you're going for those ganks there we go plus matrix as you can see on steel phenomenal item um health Magic Power, Ability Haste, and then reducing Tenacity in particular, making sure you can maximize every aspect of your kit, then they can't do as much to mitigate the, the duration of the stuns and everything like that. And then of course the bonus magic damage, it applies to Prophecy in this case as well, it applies to Tempest, and then of course your kit, which is nice. Now... The next one I included specifically for the the other side of the passive, not necessarily the anti-heal, but the malice part of this. So you are going to deal um what is that? 90 true damage every uh 15 seconds. So basically anytime that you're going for a dank, you're going to just have this extra bit of burst so that's true damage. And then if you get a takedown, you can get that extra little burst. We're really trying to ramp up what we can do in that initial combo. And it may not sound like a lot of damage, but again, it adds up very, very quickly. Definitely a flex slot. You can definitely go for a Mega Cosm here if you want to get that percent health damage instead, especially if you are trying to focus on controlling 
an opposing jungler, an opposing offlaner, something along those lines. Elafrost is also a kind of a unique item that fits really well in this build, where you can be attacking, you can get an extra root. Again, more control on your opponents that they might not expect. Can help you stay on top of someone, can help you keep someone off of someone else, etc. So just something to keep in mind, that that's very much a flex slot, but Tainted Scepter just fits and works very well inside the build. And then for our physical, to round out our physical armor, Warden's Faith, this is just again going to help us stay, keep in front of ADCs in particular, and even junglers and things like that, really try and mitigate some more of the damage from opponents like Grux and things like that. And again, since with this passive from Warden's Faith, reducing your basic ability cooldowns, you can do a lot with your basic abilities. So we're just going to try and maximize that as much as we possibly can. Next up is Richter. Richter has been absolutely phenomenal for me. He's got a skill that feels like an actual skill shot that is difficult to land, but so rewarding when you do, and it has great power scaling on top of it. He's got percent health scaling for both his survivability and for some of his damage. So he can be rewarded in building in a lot of different directions. And I, honestly, he's one, one of the most fun characters for me to play in all three of these different walls. So, Richter's support, you're going to see a lot of similar, similarities here with Narbash in that you really like to close the gap, you are great at locking down a single opponent, and your ultimate does leave you in a bit of a vulnerable position. Now granted, you get your shield when you cast your ultimate, so that definitely helps, but we're going to lean into some other resources to try and make sure that you get the most out of your kit during that time. So first up, I opted for the Rift Walkers here to be able to close that gap. That moment when you can see a pair of enemies that are just close enough together, Rift Walkers in and get a nice ultimate off, it feels so good. And this gives you another way to do that on top of your blink and everything like that. And two, can help pull enemies together even just for your ultimate, for hitting a multi-person silence, etc. Now, for his first item, we're going to go into the Hexbound Bracers. Now, Richter is extremely mana hungry. And this is very, you know, very similar to Narbash. If you're throwing a lot of hooks, you're going to run out of mana very, very quickly. And so being able to stand in front of your opponents, be able to stand kind of in waves, play a little bit more aggressively, just get more of those chains off. The more chains you can throw, the more chains you'll hit. That's kind of the core idea here. Cooldown reduction, similar similar aspect to it as well. Vanguardian, we're going to this as a nice way to go from physical armor into magical armor and health because we definitely want health on him and we definitely need some magical armor and it's also just giving us more physical armor for ourselves as well and the tenacity doesn't hurt either plus i guess there's the ally aspect no i'm kidding the ally aspect is definitely valuable as well but really even without that it would be a worthwhile build in this particular case and then true silver since we are a little bit vulnerable during our ultimate we want to try and make sure that full duration ult goes off we want to make sure that we don't die during that time period because you are stationary and everything like that. So especially in those later stages, so you have the ability to Riftwalker or Blink in to maybe a compromised, situ compromised position, get an ult off on a couple of key targets, and even if everyone else is focusing in on you, True Silver is going to allow you to have enough time to... Um, to finish your ultimate and then be able to get those other key pieces of CC off. Dynamo, this is just, again, you're going to see this in a lot of the support builds that I put together because shredding armor is a great thing to do towards the tail end of the game to ramp up your allies' damage. And then rounding it out with a Requiem. So the, the nice thing about Requiem, it kind of does two things for us. Let me get it pulled up here. So for one, magical power, we have, like I said, a ton of magic power scaling on Riplash in particular, your hook. And so amping that up a little bit can definitely catch people off guard, especially with the burst of damage from Dynamo and everything like that. And then it's giving us mana regen. So again, siege situations in particular, you can throw more hooks, always a good thing. 
And then the heal and shield power actually boosts his passive, which is nice. It's not it's not a huge stat line for him, but it's there. It's a nice little add-on. And of course, granting your allies bonus damage or bonus power and lifesteal is never a bad thing. A Richter offlane, we are really going to lean very heavily into Fire Blossom and Fox Matrix to ramp up the damage that we have, and then he loves health. He loves health. I mean, there's a lot of characters in the game right now that do, and it's certainly counterbalanced by the fact that there's so much percent health damage in the game, but you can still do a ton with it. And you might also be seeing another pattern here if you're actually watching through the whole video, that I really am a big fan of Tempest. This item has definitely been performing very well for me. If you manage to, you know, get a hook off on someone and then pop the Tempest, pop your ults, like, you can do a lot of extra damage through that that they might not be expecting. Or even just afterwards, or if you walk in behind the enemy team, gives you a little bit of extra survivability while your ultimate is going off. So just, I don't know, it's it's been performing exceptionally for me but keep in mind that near war boots in particular is a phenomenal option as is razorback all of these can give you great ways to both close the gap find good angles in terms of near war boots and then for razorback just for being able to walk at your opponents and and kind of punish you punish them for targeting you which always feels good but all right as usual so here we're going to build lock lock shawl then we're going to go into the Fire Blossom and Flux Matrix and then come back and finish up our Leviathan. So Leviathan, max health for Richter, goes with his passive, goes with his E. So you're getting that extra damage from your, from your AoE and then also is going to give us more damage in Fire Blossom. You have a ton of ways to, to be able to lock someone down for extended periods. And this is really where Fire Blossom shines. So we're building a lot of health and we're trying to maximize what we can get out of that. Flux Matrix, again, ramping up the damage that opponents can taking while also building health and getting some magical armor in the process because you do want some in your builds. You don't need a ton, but you want some. And then of course, World Breaker. This, since we're building so much health, he is dealing a lot of magic damage. We want to opt into this to be able to just take a target, especially a squishy target, say a Kalari or a Murdoch or something along those lines, grab them, be able to ult, silence, and 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 try and deal, you know, two-thirds of their health in that time period as someone who can walk into range to accomplish that. And even just if you can get a decent ult off into a Riplash, a silence, etc., Every time that you're doing this, you're getting that bonus damage and everything. It adds up very, very quickly. And of course, since we're opting into the health aspect, we've got a decent chunk of physical armor with Fire Blossom. Uh, we can round out the build with Tainted Guard. Again, I really like this item, the anti-heal, always relevant against ADCs, but this is a bit of a flex slot where you could go into something like a dynamo, especially if your uh, support is not building it. You can go into a frost guard for the extra slows to help you close the gap on opponents who are trying to kite you. You can opt to go for a golem's gift if you feel like you have a lot of kill potential on your lane opponent in the early stages. So this is definitely a bit of a flex slot, but Tainted Guard is usually what I would recommend. So as you can see here with Richter Jungle, there's not a lot there's a lot of similarities with Richter's offlane. We're opting into the Worldbreaker, the Fire Blossom, the Flux Matrix. He does very well with all of these items. But what we're layering on top of that, instead of all of those extra defensive tools, is a little bit more burst so that when you do catch someone, you can really just take them out on your own every single time. That's the idea at least. So let's dive into the example here. Uh, starting out, we're going to grab Obelisk. Now, this is a really nice one with Richter in particular because he can combo, he can activate this, he can get that auto attack in after his ultimate is finished and everything, and it's an extra burst of damage. It really adds up quite quickly with some of the other elements that we have here and allows you to 
have kind of this ramping uh, magic power aspect as well, because again, Riplash, 100% magic power scaling. So when you're hitting those hooks and you have, you know, five, six, ten stacks on this alongside the base power and everything else that we have in here, it adds up very, very quickly while still allowing us to build some defensive resources. Plus, again, we're leaning very heavily into the burst aspect of his kit and the fact that it's really easy to weave in auto attacks. And we're going to lean into that even more than with the Oath Keeper. So this is going to give us bonus damage, magic power, health, which very, very important. This is a great way to start off the game. You don't necessarily have to build it first, but it makes those initial ganks that much more potent. Fire Blossom, however, can you can build that a little bit earlier so that you can speed up your clear. It's a little bit cheaper too, so if you're getting forced back, if you are struggling to catch up, build the Fire Blossom first, then go into the Oath Keeper. The sequencing there, you can kind of do either or. Oath Keeper is just the more aggressive option that will allow you to have more kill potential. Flux Matrix, again, health, ability, haste. We're building into a little bit of magic armor so that we're not just so that we're eating a little a bit of uh especially with all the health that we have we have the health pool plus that little bit of magic armor just to take the edge off of what mages are doing and then going into a world breaker as we kind of talked about on the solo lane build we're getting percent max power health all all four of the items that we've built up to this point have max health including the oath keeper it's one of the reasons it fits so well into this build that oath keeper that is and then again, we're ramping up our damage so that our combos, we have more potential to actually kill our opponents, even though we're opting into these defensive resources in Fire Blossom and Flux Matrix, so that we're not a true assassin, but we're still, we still can kind of act as a pseudo assassin. And then to round out the build, you could go into something more defensive, you could go into a sustain item. You could do a lot of different things, but I opt in for the Caustica just to give you more fight potential against soul laners against off laners I need to call them off laners against off laners against junglers who are building his tanks and even to just if for instance a mid laner builds a spellbreaker or something along those lines or you see things like the true silver bracelet coming through even you know i mean obviously the cc immunity and everything is going to be good against you but after they'll still be taking a lot of damage at the very least so Kostika helping to eat through some of those, and then also just giving you mana regen. As we've mentioned in, in the other two, Richter, extremely mana hungry. There's nothing in this build that gives us mana until this point, which is why, you know, I mean, we're not building to the Hexbound. You don't really, I mean, you can. I put it even here as a situational thing you can build into if you're going a more full tank route, but most of the time rounding out with Caustica is going to give us that mana regen that we need for those longer fights while also just boosting our damage that last little bit so hopefully push us over the top as a jungler. Next up is Gadget. Gadget is relatively straightforward. We have a zone control mage who with her passive she really wants to build some mana and everything like that so that you can get this nice defensive layer where you're getting you're getting a shield based on 12 percent of your max mana so there's definitely some aspects to the builds that you want to lean into that aspect of it that you have this defensive layer and also ways that you can boost it and then you have really really strong magical power scaling on both of your damage over time the seek and destroy and the tesla dome effects but you have to kind of keep opponents in there so she definitely is rewarded for comboing with allies who have cc or even just using the security gate to be able to lock someone in for that extra second or 1.25 seconds inside of your ultimate inside the drone etc so the nice thing is too that as we lean a little bit into pushing that defensive resource of her passive of shock absorber you can, because Security Gate is a little more short range, you can poke a little bit with the Sticky Mine and everything like that, keep your distance there. When you want to go in for that Security Gate play, it can give you some more options and flexibility and how aggressive you can be with that passive. 
All right, so first up, Gadget's natural roll, mid lane. Very, very potent mage. Can be a little bit vulnerable at times to being outranged or to being to a jungler sitting on top of you. You do have to be careful with how you use security gate in particular. We know that like if you go in for that aggressive play and you use that, you use your ultimate, you might become very vulnerable to dying to the jungler in particular. Sorry, with that, let's go ahead and dive into the example build. So, first up, Epoch. Choosing this because having that extra layer of defensive resource is just fantastic. If you can pop your ultimate down on top of you, right? And some, you know, because the jungler is dove you or whatever, and then you pop Epoch and they can't do anything to you for multiple seconds, they might just have to leave because otherwise they're going to take so much damage from standing there waiting for that in that two and a half seconds that you have immunity that it they, they may not again have a choice but to leave and give you space which is great the other nice thing here too is that owie ultimate get gideon ultimate or even you know they're if uh if a richter is slightly slow then you might be able to get it off between a hook and the rest of his abilities. Not very often, but it can happen. You can use it to dodge a steel ult. There's just so many things that you can get away from with this item that, especially out of mid lane, on someone who doesn't have a ton of mobility, it's really hard not to go for this particular item. Sorry, right, first up for actual items then is going to go, be, we're going to go into an Azure Core. Now with this, similar to Leviathan, you can build the tier two of it, um, the alchemical rod, and then come back. You can stack this up and then come back and finish the Azure Core. But the Azure Core has decent enough stats on it that it's enough of a power spike. You can also just go ahead and finish it. Just be aware that you won't get as much as finishing your next couple of items and then coming back for it. But it does stack quickly. Like, it feels like it stacks faster than some of the other stacking items in the game. But anyway, the reason we're building this, we want the extra mana for the passive and everything like that. Plus, it's just a good chunk of damage. Astral Catalyst, you're going to see this item a lot on our magic damage dealers because, in particular, of the Ravenous passive. Takedowns, refund, 25% of your ultimate's cooldown, and this is takedowns, this is kills, and assists. This is great. This is just beyond phenomenal for a character that has this massive zone control ultimate that can really catch your opponents off guard with being able to use it, get a kill, and then have all of this cooldown reduction, have the ravenous reset, etc. Not to mention the fact that like the passive part of Astral Catalyst is also just very strong, getting percent boosts in magical power. This is going to pair very well with the tail end of our build which we'll get to in a second. But all right, next up, going into Caustica. So even though we have a lot of mana and everything, mana regen, always nice to be able to keep us on the map, keep us farming, keep us in fights, etc. But really here on this on Gadget in particular with this particular build, it's for the percent pen. Um, at this point, most of the time, third item, as I said at the very beginning, we're walking into those orb prime fights. We're walking into the second, third, Fangtooth fight, something along those lines. People have started building their magical armor. They're going to have some of that. This is going to help you eat through some of that to keep your damage relevant when you can't always get it onto an ADC or your opposing mage or things like that. If you have, if you can't close the gap, the gap safely at first, this is going to help really increase what your poke can do in particular. And then after that, going into Wraith Leggings. Now, the nice part about this, we have a lot of slows inside our kit as Gadget. So Wraith Leggings, we're going to get this movement speed, which is going to help us kite opponents. And then also dealing bonus damage against enemy heroes before 40% max health. Gadget in particular is really unique in that her primary damage ability, the Sticky Mine, has a delay on when it deals damage. So you can land the hat on someone and then they can take other splash damage or other damage from damage from other characters and everything and it can still end up triggering 
enough on this on this triggering this multiplier because they've dropped below that 40 percent health point even if they were three quarters health when you first landed the bomb and even just on its own right being able to you know use seek and try to poke use the gate for your full combo etc ramping up your damage having a double multiplier in there is always fantastic and then last but not least to round out the build oblivion crown we're going for some magic power increase the oblivion crown and astral catalyst you're going to see this a lot <laughs> those two work extremely well together because you're getting this baseline increase of magical power and then astral Catal catalyst is multiplying that again and you're just ramping it up astronomically high okay so gadget support i'm gonna say right now the gadget support is difficult to pull off and very tempo oriented you're going to see that in this build and we'll talk a little bit about how all of that is working but you have a root you have two different ways to slow opponents and you're laning in the laning phase you are absolutely obnoxious it is a little bit challenging to you you have to make sure that in the rest of your team you have those people who can stand in front who can provide the extra cc that you need especially as a gadget even you know but this is a potential way to combo say a gideon ult out of mid and a gadget ult for instance there are ways and benefits to doing this but you know fair warning that it is difficult to pull off so looking at the example build we have um we're going to go into the consort quest crest options there's really no reason to not do that you want the bonus damage in the early stages as i mentioned gadget is extremely tempo oriented if you're playing her as a support you really have to be poking opponents out so the consort quest is going to help you do exactly that now tranquility this is going to give you a nice layer of defense on top of everything we're going to build a little bit of heal heal and shield power that's going to buff this up as well plus we're building a ton of magic power so the heal here is not is going to get ramped up a little bit at least but it's really just gadget's way of providing that extra layer of support other than the slows and the root and things like that because those are relatively short duration you can get around them if they're not properly placed and so especially if your alt is on cooldown etc it's just a nice way to be able to say hey adc i can i can in fact keep you alive in particular so all right next up going into time warp again the this whole idea of gadget support is that you're going to just bomb 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 you don't even have to level your right click early on you can go bomb gate bomb at level three and you can you know as you start getting met that maxed out time warp is going to give you the extra mana regen to be able to actually consistently be throwing those out because you are mana hungry in the early stages so you really have to you have to manage that well and then additionally like just being able to do it more often especially when it comes to the root and everything like that so say you throw down the root all right so now they've gotten out of that you get your slow down you get your bomb down and you might be able to get the root off again before the opponent gets into you know closes entirely closes the gap on your adc especially if they can create some space for themselves as well next up we're going into another nice cheap item in the marshal and that's part of the reason we're going for this is that similar to what we talked about with muriel support we're trying to push and push and push and push so every little bit of damage that we can get for our adc in particular is is going to it's just going to add up very quickly with what you can do on your own and then to boosting your own magical damage or boosting your own auto attack damage gives you another way to consistently poke without having to use your right click or your gate or anything like that and be able to help push out waves which in a tempo oriented build you might want to do although i will say as a support generally speaking don't hit the waves unless you know what you're doing and you're with the person you're talking to anyway that's a whole other video 
Going into Requiem, we're going to this relatively early because, again, we're pushing the tempo. We want that mana regen. We want the little bit of magic power. And we want to start stacking this up. Or, well, rather, we want to start using the stacks that we get so that we have just more power for those ultimates, especially this third item. Again, we're going into those Orb Prime fights. We want to ramp up as much as we can for Orb Prime, for Fangtooth, for those kind of key jungle fights in particular where Gadget loves to fight. Now, you can... As an alternative to that, you can build the Dreambinder before the Requiem. Always an option. Dreambinder is really nice because this is going to give you an extra slow inside your kit. Enemies are going to be slowed for an extra 0.25 seconds after they leave the gate, the route from the gate, which is nice. You will have the slow added to your mine, which also very, very effective. And then, of course, your ultimate and your right click already apply a slow, and so you're going to get bonus damage, which are damage you're not going to be doing a ton, right? Especially at this point, four items in, people are going to be relatively beefy, they're going to have a lot of base stats to work with, but every little bit does add up. And then rounding out the build with just a nice little spell shield to make sure that we have a layer of safety. This is very much a flex slot. You can go into anti-heal here. Tainted and Scepter in particular is always strong with gadgets so that you can have that bonus true damage coming through on, you know, every, you know, fourth or so mine. Uh, it's probably like sixth mine. Your, your mines get to a ridiculously low cooldown at a certain point. But anyway, so for this build in particular, again, very tempo oriented, designed to run at your opponents and push what gadgets does support does best. Not the only way to do it, so obviously check the spreadsheet and everything like that for other inspiration. Well let's move on. Alright, so gadget offlane. This is this is a really interesting is it's just a really interesting playstyle because you have in this particular build you have this double stacking aspect where you've also got some really early power, a lot of poke, and then come late game, a ton of survivability where you can kind of walk in, ult on top of yourself, and heal through a lot of stuff. You can't be the main focus with this build, but it really does let you kind of stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with, at least for a few seconds, with some of the junglers and things like that. As long as they're not too far ahead. We've got some great defensive layers in here to, to really augment both her passive and push that while also just adding to it. So let's take a quick look here. Starting off, Tempest. As you can tell, I really like this one. I will say that Soul Bearer out of Offlane is also excellent because, especially with this particular build, as a different way of having a defensive resource and getting your mana stacking a little, or getting your mana uh, Magician Crest gives you mana whereas occult gives you health so you can be a little more ability uh spammy in the laning phase with the magician crest by comparison so that's definitely a play style preference in terms of which crest that you actually opt for tempest is just nice in this particular build because we want to kind of walk onto the edge of an enemy team stand be standing close enough to get that active to get the flux matrix active and everything like that so then the other kind of unique thing about this build is that we're going to build two tier two stacking items and then we're going to, well, okay, you don't have to do it this way. If you want to push the early tempo, build the tier two of this and then go into the Golem's Gift. If you want to push the stacking aspect of the build more quickly, build tier two of the azure or build tier two leviathan your shawl i still think that shawl is worth building first although now that i'm saying that core would help with some of the mana, mana issues early on might have to play around with that a little bit but anyway regardless of which that you build first and everything you can build both of them and then go into the golem's gift and this is where your your wave clear and everything like that is going to ramp up dramatically so that you can really help with the stacking process you can even if you have a lane where you can be more aggressive 
You can even go into the Golem's Gift first for that heavy poke and everything like that. And then, like I said, we're going to go into double stacking items, which, you know, maybe it's a little greedy, not going to lie. There are some other versions of this build in the spreadsheet that are uh, a little less so, but going into Leviathan Azure Core and then rounding this out with our magic armor. So we already have our physical armor kind of covered with the Golem's Gift. Now we're going to get a little bit more health and, and some ability haste in the Flux Matrix. We're getting a lot of ability haste from Leviathan. That's why it's not super necessary to build a lot of it here. We're still going to, well, as soon as Leviathan is complete, you'll be able to spam as much as you want to. And then Flux Matrix is just letting us play kind of, again, on that more mid-range so that you can walk in, you can drop your ult on yourself when you are fighting against the jungler and everything like that, and just do a lot of work there. And then that's... Uh, and, uh, then especially alongside our final item, Life Binder. So we've built up a bunch of health. We have the Leviathan, we have the Flux Matrix, and now we're getting even a little bit more from the Life Binder itself. We're getting base life steal for magical life steal, and then also every time you deal that damage, your poke and everything like that, you're gaining a percent of your max health is is being restored over eight seconds so especially in long if you can make it so that fights are longer so they're more drawn out not always easy to do but in those kind of poke wars this will give you an advantage so in siege situations in particular this can be an excellent resource now world breaker also if you're having trouble getting close to people you can pair this with the world breaker instead of flux matrix so that you have an even larger health pool so that your damage is kind of getting ramped up over time with your bombs and your right click. Just a lot of different situational things that you can think about, but hopefully this gives you a general idea of how to build a kind of more bruiser style gadget. All right, Gideon. Gideon is really cool. I actually, I like a lot of what they did with this kit. I will say though, his right click for me, I don't know what it is. And even for some of the other the people who have been coming back who are a little less experienced and everything, it's really hard to hit for some reason. His Q is easy, his Q feels really good, the delay on it is great, but for some reason his right click, something is just not clicking in my brain with that one. Granted, I haven't necessarily played a ton of him, so there's also that. But what I really like about his kit is his passive. So you have this opportunity to hit an enemy with an ability, to hit them with an auto attack, get this extra damage over time. This makes your early trades in the laning phase excellent. If you can get inside that range and actually hit your abilities, you know, caveat there, then you can you can take these right click trades or sorry other MOBAs, they are right clicks. This game, left click. You can tra take these left click trades, these auto attack trades, and and come out ahead or force your opponent away from the waves so that you can get advantages. It really makes space for yourself. So keep an eye on that timer, uh, on the cooldown timer for your passive and everything like that, so that you use that effectively, so that you're closing gaps when you can around that. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. And then as ultimate, also insane magical power scaling you thought gadget had a lot <laughs> gideon's ult does a lot of damage now granted it is extremely rewarding when you don't get stunned out of it when you don't get silenced out of it etc 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 so there are definitely some things that you have to keep in the back of your mind there are some resources we can lean on in order to make it a little bit more reliable but when you pull it off it is insane all right so this build be prepared, you're going to see this build a lot. Alright, Gideon, mid lane. This is kind of just our default burst build. We are stacking a bunch of different percentage scalers into the build and trying to push his damage as high as possible. Now, until uh, there are a couple of things here, but let's go ahead and dive into the example build because we can talk about it as we go. But really, what I want to get at is that you don't necessarily have, you're not building into an early true silver or something along those lines, but you can. It is a defensive resource for Gideon that 
can be a good option. You can build the Mesmer earlier on, or the Spellbreaker, sorry, the Spellbreaker earlier on. There we go. <laughs> I was having trouble finding the crest. Anyway, so Epoch. I really like this crest, as I've talked about with, with Gadget. There's so many things that you can dodge, that you can get out of, that you can buy time for your Torn Space to come back online, or to come back off cooldown. Now, granted, you can go into a Soul Bearer with an Azure Core and go into that kind of more shield-oriented route so that, you know, maybe if there's not a lot of CC or if you're finding that your opponents are having a hard time um, stopping your ultimate but you're just dying during it, then that those are kind of the situations where you can look at a Soul Bearer instead. Personally, Obelisk also... It feels kind of nice for those right-click trades and just like his base kit. Admittedly, the it doesn't interact that well with his ultimate and everything because you're just sitting there. You can't right, uh, you can't attack. So, but it's there. It's an option. Um, the first actual item that we'll go into is going to be the Astral Catalyst. Again, be prepared to see this item all the time, especially for a character that relies so heavily on his ultimate. Astral Catalyst can allow you to get the, not ultimate resets, but be able to, you know, get that that much faster. And it's a significant chunk, right? Plus, again, you're kind of a combo mage. A lot of the times you will be using your um, Torn Space into your ultimate, so even just getting that three, uh, let's see, that'll be 6% bonus power for the duration of your ultimate. It's quite nice. And again, comboing, you have, you know, your rocks that you're hitting, it ramps up the power for your passive. So when you're taking those kinds of trades, it's very effective. And the next up, Wraith Legging. So this is going to be another multiplier. It can allow you to, since you have some solid range on Gideon, to be able to hit your opponent's kite back or just get into range for to be able to teleport for a good ultimate, to be able to find better angles. The movement speed is definitely something you want to keep in mind that is just very strong on that particular item. Caustica, this is where we're getting our mana regen in particular. Not as mana hungry as some of the other characters, but you will notice it, especially if you can't get the river buffs early on. And then you're reaching those later stages where you're out of the laning phase, you're taking these longer fights around Orb Prime and everything, so you you want to be able to use your Q in particular as much as possible. Costa's is going to help enable that. And then, like I said, as many damage multipliers as we can. So we're going into an Oblivion Crowd now. What I wanted to say a little bit earlier especially with the Spellbreaker, you can build the Spellbreaker much earlier in your build, especially if there's only one, maybe two key things that the opponent uh, can use to stop your ultimate. Now, True Silver. I've seen a lot of people talking about this as like, oh, it's so unfair and things like that. I think what people don't realize is that True Silver Amulet the CC immunity goes away as soon as the shield is broken. So, when you ult in, ADC hits you with one shot. If you haven't built health in your build, that's going to take the shield away, and you're going to be able to get CC out of your ultimate. Both for, kind of a tip for playing with and against Gideon. That, or, yeah that you want to break that shield before the CC comes through. Don't just, you know, watch what your opponent is building. If he has a true silver, wait for that shield to be gone, then silence, then Richter hook, then whatever, right? Spellbreaker is much more reliable at being able to stop that because it'll stop that first ability that you're hit with regardless of how much damage you take at the beginning of your ultimate. So just keep that in mind as kind of comparing the two. You can also build them together. I don't know exactly how that interaction works. <laughs> but it is a possibility and something that you can do if you want to find out. But if you're having trouble getting your ults off, you can build this much earlier. You can shift it. You can even build it second. And then just move the whole build down. Build your Oblivion Crown last, etc. I would still probably build Caustica third. 
just so that you have that mana regen and everything. But you can delay the Wraith Leggings and kind of shift things around that way. Just so that you have that more reliable ultimate um, around some of those big fights if you're struggling to to kind of time it around those pieces of CC. Or if they have something like a Richter that just has infinite CC and you need to be able to say, okay, like, I can get above the, the, the silence, but trying to get out of the Riplash range and everything like that, this can then give you that extra layer of safety, especially for those mid-game fights. I just realized I think I was tra saying True Seeker. I apologize. I have been recording a lot, obviously, and a little... It's been a long, it's been a long week and a half putting this together. So True Silver Bracelet is what I was talking about in in the mid video my apologies <laughs> for saying true seeker because i'm pretty sure i did that multiple times there but all right so soul and gideon you soul and gideon is awesome because you have this great base damage in your kit and that gives you just a ton of flexibility in how you build and there were some people who were who were building the galaxy greaves who were building the true silver bracelet and everything like that and it's surprisingly effective, and I wanted to kind of show what I think is a, a more refined option of of those uh, of where those started out. So again, I'm going into Tempest here. Epoch and Soulbearer are both great options. Soulbearer gives you a little bit. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind: I don't know which shield goes is taken away from first between Soul Bearer and True Silver. That'll be something that'll be really interesting to find out as we get a little bit more information. But um, if the Soul Bearer shield is taken first, then it, that actually might become the default in this slot because then you'll get your CC immunity for even for potentially the full duration of your ultimate. So, so just something the, to kind of keep in mind that that crest, even though I really like Tempest, I like to pop it and then go and ult on top of my opponents. It's not, it, the other two options are excellent and will give you better mana sustain in, in those levels. I put Tempest here because of kind of a personal bias. But you'll even see in the in the spreadsheet that I'm like, you can do any of these. Here's kind of the, the reasons behind them and everything. But okay, so first up, we're going to go into the uh, tier two of Leviathan. So the reason that we're doing this, we're, we're going to tier two Leviathan, we're going to build golems, we're going to build true silver. Leviathan, it's going to give us cooldown reduction, it's going to give us health for the um, true silver bracelet, both things that we really, really want on Gideon. Now, so you built the tier two, now we're going to build our first actual power item. Golem's gift is fantastic when you can stay at range or if you're in a matchup that isn't doing a lot of physical damage doesn't have physical damage abilities you can again keep your range and everything like that just the amount of power that it offers 110 power gideon scaling you know if you can get in even if you take a hit jump up and ult on top of a fight and you have you know had uh, 100 bonus magic power that is still 240 bonus dam or 240 extra damage on your ultimate as long as i'm remembering that scaling correctly yeah 240 bonus damage coming from that item until they start to hit you more <laughs> that's a lot like <laughs> that's that's huge so, Golem's Gift, great for, for that initial burst and everything like that, and giving you a little bit more durability so that you can reposition, you have more time to be able to, to push push your kit, be able to use the de other defensive resources like Torn Space and everything when you do get caught out and everything like that. Because it'll happen eventually. <laughs> Alright, then True Silver Bracelet. This is really... Part of the reason why Gideon solo works, because you are building these health aspects, you're building into true silver so that you can get this massive shield when you ult, and you can't get knocked out of it. And it's a, a big enough shield by the end of the build that you can take a couple of hits from an ADC. You can take, you know, a little bit of damage here and there. So as long as you're timing it, you're not the, like, very first person in type of thing. 
it can be really, really strong. And then Galaxy Greaves, this was so cool when I saw someone talking about this in Discord. Um, Galaxy Greaves allows you to like walk in and jump to be at the height you want to be at to ult rather than having to use torn space so you can jump you can get your ult off say you get you know you you're dropping down out of it you can torn space immediately away from it without having to wait those few seconds for it to come off cooldown it's been so much fun to play with and two with galaxy greaves there's a lot of just cool places that you can jump over jump through and walls that you might be able to get up on top of where people wouldn't expect you to be there just a lot of fun things that you can do a flux matrix i put this in here specifically because most of the time you will be able to be close enough with your ultimate for this to apply now if you can't you can go into another defensive resource and, and i don't know the exact range on this aura it could be that it is just bad especially with the galaxy greaves and things like that so this one you could definitely replace with the world breaker you could go into a dream binder just for more straight damage you could go into a different piece of magical armor um like say the spellbreaker spellbreaker obviously we've talked about this i don't know exactly how spellbreaker and true silver interact um but i'm Assuming that the shield will get popped and then you'll still have the CC immunity because you didn't take damage from whatever ability it was. Um, so there's definitely a lot of options here. If Flux, Flux Matrix turns out to just feel not as impactful. But this is really nice to be a health item in particular. Where you're again giving yourself that little extra boost on the true silver shield to mitigate some of the late game damage that you're going to run into. All right, next up is Howitzer. So Howitzer is a lot of fun. His passive is interesting because he gets bonus damage and he restores mana. So his laning phase, you can be really spammy, especially if you're getting that auto attack onto opposing heroes. I don't know. I, I like Howitzer a lot. Um, but anyway, sorry. So that cooldown also, anytime you use an ability... It gets reduced, so you hit someone, you get that mana back, you use an ability, you're spending the mana, you hit them again, yada yada yada. The key to Howitzer, though, is really like learning his combo, where you are going to place the slow grenade, you are going to land by them through the slow grenade, and then hit them with your Q. If you can get that combo down, Howitzer is a monster. Absolute monster. Very tricky to do, but very rewarding when you can pull it off. And then he has this nice defensive layer in his ultimate that does a pretty significant amount of damage. Decent scaling, obviously not as much as Gadget and Gideon, but it is targeted, so like it probably shouldn't be. You can't really walk out of this in the same way. So overall, really just leaning into power here. Howitzer doesn't necessarily offer a lot for the other roles, similar, unlike Gadget and Gideon, who have more control in their kits and things like that. While he does have a little bit of zone control, he's mostly there for that burst damage and being able to get out of bad situations with the Make It Rain, while dealing a ton of damage in the process. And being able to use that vertical space in particular after the make it rain to make it difficult for enemies to respond to what you're doing. All right, so as I mentioned, we've only got we've only got one build for Howitzer. Well, okay, I shouldn't say we only have one build for him. We only have one role for Howitzer, and that is mid lane, and that he shines there. You can take him into solo and things like that, but realistically, you're going to build him the same way most of the time. Most of the time, I, I will be completely honest with you, you probably just want to go with the burst build. With uh, It's the recommended build in the spreadsheet and everything. But here, I wanted to just take a moment, because this is the only actual mage where it feels fun to build the attack speed version of of him. Uh, to be build the attack, attack speed magical power items. There we go. Now... One other thing I'll say, don't play Howie ADC right now. 
it doesn't work. Your damage scaling is not high enough to compare in terms of your your specifically your auto attack damage is not high enough to compete with physical ADCs. Not right now. And that's okay. I don't even think that it should necessarily get to the point where those two things can be even because that would be pretty absurd. But out of mid lane, this gives you a different way to play him that is fun. So opting first off our crest typhoon. Uh, we're going into the attack speed aspect of this now. If you need a defensive resource, epoch is great. Soul bearer can be okay, but since we're not building Azure Core, it it will lack a little bit of oomph in terms of that shield. So typhoon. Really, really powerful. Obelisk is another way to kind of play this build as a as a more burst alternating, or as as a still more burst oriented build, without having to go um, away from the other attack speed items. Which, speaking of prophecy, this is going to give us more on hit magic damage. Um, this is going to give us the consistent on hit magic damage because obviously your passive it does it every once in a while, but this does it more often. Along with still giving us a decent chunk of ability haste, actually, on both of this and Magnify, um, which those are going to be, you know, we're building all three of the magic power attack speed items. May not be necessary to do this, to be honest. Um, might be that. But the nice thing about Magnify and Prophecy in particular is they're really rewarding you for weaving in those auto attacks to get that bonus damage, Magnify in particular. And then Prophecy is, like, it's a nice quality of life to be able to do that consistently. Caustica, great item. Obviously, we're getting our mana regen this way. In this particular build, especially since we're opting for the Occult Crest, you can, as Howie, very safely take the river buffs by standing on the ledges and using your Q and things like that, as long as you get just close enough. But, again, mana regen, even though he has it built into his kit, it just becomes a little bit easier when you have this aspect to it. Plus, pen. I mean, you're, you're always going to want some amount of magical pen, and this is kind of the only item that does it for us. Oblivion Crown is going to give us that nice damage multiplier, which is going to apply both to you on our on-hit damage from our passive and from Prophecy, and then just boost our kit overall. So we're not really losing too much, too much, burst we're losing some multipliers um compared to the the like normal build with astral catalyst and everything like that and opting for that dps aspect of having more of the the auto attack damage and then rounding out last but not least with spellbreaker just for that little bit of defensive layer it's a nice thing to have you can also build this before the oblivion crown especially oblivion crown's kind of expensive so if you're going back and you need to be getting some components and things like that, you need to be preparing for a big fight. Spellbreaker can be a great thing to pick up. You can also be build it even earlier if you're really being targeted heavily by someone with with those pieces of CC like Rampage or admittedly Richter has a lot of ways to pop that bubble. But especially if it's a more mid-range mage or something like that that will have trouble popping that bubble or if Bellica, something along those lines, she can pop it, obviously, but usually her combo is what would pop it, not necessarily just a random, random, like, Gideon Q or whatever, so you have more time to react to, to the bomb. But anyway, I digress. Rounding out the build with a nice defensive resource that you can build here or there, obviously a lot of different options to kind of finish the build. Um, I will say Megacosm in the attack speed build, not particularly good great in the burst build. Tainted Scepter is probably what I would uh, run here more often than not as far as replacing it with something just because anti-heal is pretty important. It's not Im as important as I thought it was in the original video, but anyway, just to give you some ideas of, of some of those things that you can swap out in this build in particular. Next up, a mage I do not see often enough. Man, Bellica is such a monster. But I don't see her very often. I love her. Oh, we're actually going to have her in mid and support. So we've got two roles for that. I have been playing her out of support like mad. And also even in mid, she has proven to be very powerful in some of those matchups that 
sometimes just feel a little tricky otherwise. Granted, still not necessarily the, the best into a Gideon or something like that, but essentially Bellica is great at controlling space. She's a combo-oriented mage. She has a huge amount of burst damage in her kit. And then her passive, the nice thing about this, anytime you max out an ability, they're going to gain a little bit extra. So in this case, Void Bomb is going to get extra scaling. Your stun is going to last a bit longer. The drone is going to drain more mana because it will actually drain mana on hit as well as the um, current mana each second. And then your Disruptor it increases by range so that once you have that maxed in particular, you'll be able to take someone out from a little farther away. Definitely significant. But the other key thing to keep in mind is that she gets 10% increased maximum mana every time she maxes out an ability. This is pretty huge and makes Azure Core a very, very strong item on her because you're going to get a ton of extra power from the passive from that. So, just something to keep in the back of your mind, that Azure Core is excellent, you're a combo-oriented mage, and when you're leveling your abilities, another kind of key thing to keep in mind, most of the time you will want to kind of skip leveling your ultimate, uh, no, not skip it, but like, you will max your Void Bomb, right, and then you could even skip the, the second point in your ultimate to get, unlock some of these innovations, may not be always be the correct choice but the other thing to keep in mind too is which ability you max will definitely change the playstyle a little bit right maybe you want to max void drone first after a couple of points in your bomb if you're up against something like a crunch or a severog that's super spammy so you can drain their mana even faster or maybe if you're playing support bellica obviously like most of the time you're going to uh, max out your seismic assault so that you have the additional stun. So just keep in mind that extra effect as you're deciding which abilities to max first and when you point put points into abilities. Alright, so Bellica Mind, this is going to be relatively straightforward. Admittedly, you might not end up with a whole lot of diversity for a mid lane Bellica because there are just so many items that work exceptionally well for her. Granted, you might not see a whole lot of diversity out of mid most of the time anyway because, you know, you need those power items. But with her in particular, we're going to start out with Epoch. This is my default on her in most situations. You do not have, you have your knockup, which is an excellent defensive resources, but as soon as that's down, you have nothing. So you really have to keep that in mind that Epoch can buy you a ton of crucial time it can get you out of bad situations inside of a Gadget Ultimate, inside of a Gideon Ultimate. How it's, I keep bringing those three up, but Epoch is absolutely phenomenal at countering those alts. Now, that said, Soul Bearer is not a bad resource because we're going to be building Azure Core. We're going to be ramping up our mana with the passive. So the shield here does have a bit more oomph than usual. Personally, I've just found it to be less impactful than Epoch. But Soul Bearer is admittedly a little bit easier to use. Now, Time Flux Band, there is so much potential in this item. I personally have not been able to pull off a lot with it. I have seen other people use it to mix success. But being able to run forward, combo someone real quick, get teleported back, and have those cooldowns reset, be able to stun someone again in particular, extremely powerful. So, if you're feeling like you want to be tricksy, Time Flux Band, very, very strong. Just keep that in the back of your mind. All right, and then as we mentioned, we're going into the Azure Core. With this, you can build the Tier 2 of it, the uh, Alchemical Rod first. Finish your next item. Usually, by the time you're done with your second item, you're close to finished stacking. And then you can come back and finish your Azure Core to get the uh, the full effect of all of it. So then, as I mentioned, we're going into the Astro Catalyst. This is what's going to really give us a lot of oomph on our combos. Because again, most of the time, it's Drone, Knockup, Bomb, Alt. So, and, and that sequence is very, very powerful, right? Especially, you know, if you've managed to use your Drone before, you've drained a little bit of mana... You, you've done some poking with your auto attacks, etc. Even just in your second combo, then 
it gives you a lot more likelihood that you can actually ult someone and have them taken down in that time period. Now, Kostika, again, with this one, it's our default percent pen or a default magic pen item because other than Wraith Leggings, but there's just not a whole lot of magic pen options in the game. We have Wraith Leggings, Combustion, and Caustica. Combustion feels really underwhelming to me. The bonus damage is like, it's okay, but it's nothing compared to Wraith Leggings and Caustica. So going into Caustica, we're also going to get the mana regen. Not a huge issue on Bellica, but it's there. Um, and, and we're getting a lot of mana back consistently because we have so much max mana. So if you've actually fall below 50%, you're going to get up pretty quickly. So that at least that 50% mark. Race leggings. So this is going to give us movement speed, which is definitely useful on someone who doesn't have any mobility outside of your blink. Nice damage amp too. Again, that kind of concept that we're going to get someone low and then we're ramping up the damage for our ultimate. Really, really important to have that aspect. And then last but not least, again, we're going with the Oblivion Crown. This combination with Astral Catalyst of we're ramping up our base power, Catalyst is then multiplying that again. We get so much value out of those items put together. And then the Azure Core on top of all of it, we're getting so much power. It's kind of it's kind of obscene, actually, <laughs> especially once you're max level and all of your abilities are maxed out. You have all of that mana ramp. Bellica can really do a lot of damage at that point. I mean, even before then. But just keep that in back of your mind that you really want those damage amp effects. A lot of the times when you're replacing something for, say, the Tainted Scepter or if you need the percent health damage, it will be either the Wraith Leggings or the, or the Oblivion Crown. Um, more often than not, I would opt into replacing the Wraith Leggings, but if you need the movement speed still, you can drop the Oblivion Crown, you can potentially drop Caustica as well. Again, that mana regen, not as necessary on Bellica. Um, so if you don't need that, uh, percent, or if you don't need the penetration, then you can go into just a Megacosm or a Tainted Scepter or something along those lines in that slot, and that works really well too, and lets you keep all of your damage amp. Uh, multipliers. So, Velika support. As we mentioned, Velika has a lot of zone control, and what Velika support offers is this nice long range stun that can allow you to apply pressure to the lane that can give your give your team a lot of safety depending on where you're positioned. You you have a lot more flexibility in your positioning to then be able to still save someone from a chimera jump or something along those lines and then with that too the drone the drone does a lot of work and then you have this added damage that you're bringing into it with your ultimate to be able to secure kills at a longer range than some other people might be able to and to be able to just have this sudden burst you really can go for a more like tempo oriented build on her but you can also go kind of a hybrid build, like I'm going to, like we'll go through in this example, where you actually have some durability, you can stand, you can withstand a little bit. You can't necessarily play on the front line, but you can definitely kind of get in the way of the jungler, of the offlaner, of things like that, so that you can use your own character to create more space for your allies. So in this example build, I'm going into Tranquility. Now, most of the time, I would recommend going for the consort options because, again, you're a little tempo oriented. You have a lot of control, so it's not quite the same as a Muriel or something like that where you really have to push hard. But the other thing that I want to mention, though, Rift Walkers can be phenomenal. Being able to close the distance all of a sudden and get your knockup since you just adding extra range to your knockup, right, can do a lot. Keep that in the back of your mind. It's a little bit slower of a laning phase option. It is a more aggressive resource once you have it upgraded. So it's kind of a weird spot in that regard. But you can still use the healing that you're getting from the Guardian Crest and everything to your advantage in the laning phase. Certainly not saying, not, not saying that you can't. Just the Consort Crest gives you a little bit more pressure. A little bit more kill potential. Forces your opponents to use more resources. 
Tranquility is just also a nice resource here at the end game, or even in the mid game, because we're still building a decent chunk of power while also then giving us that damage mitigation for ourselves since we're building some tank items. It's really nice to have that so that you don't just get run over. All right, time warp. Next up, time warp. This is how we are really going to enable our stun to be up often enough to justify being a support. And to be fair, it's very similar to playing Narbash, but the rest of your kit is very offensive, offensive, like aggressive, not mean. Uh, all right. Anyway. <laughs> Time Warp is really going to help a ton, because most of the time, like I said, we want a combo. We want to start with either the drone or the knockup, and then you're using your bomb for that extra little bit of damage. And so already there, right, we're reducing the cooldown of our um, of our knockup by 15%, up to one second. And, and then if you drone afterwards, or you drone before, then you're reducing the cooldown of the drone. Those are all very relevant factors. All of her base abilities are nuts. So, um, and then we're going to jump into our physical armor here. Now, you've got some different options. I have played around with Gollum's Gift. I personally don't find it that impactful by comparison, because you're not building those other other power items behind it so you might have some initial extra pressure and everything like that but i found the cooldown from hexbound to just be nuts it's very rare that you're running low on mana because your right click gives you mana back based on enemies hit you most of the time are only using abilities when you're going for your full combos and so i guess i shouldn't say that but anyway frequently so Hexbound just offers a lot of value. That cooldown reduction is something that you, you definitely can't ignore. Now with this, then we can go into a Requiem. Now this is something that can be built at different stages of the game. You can build it a little bit later, build some of these other items first if you need the magic defense and things like that from the Vanguardian, which we'll build next. Um, but Requiem is going to give us that magic power boost for ourselves, both in just the base stats, and then also amp up the damage of our allies. Something just are really valuable for a ranged support like Velika, especially someone who can take advantage of the magical power in the way that she can. And then Vanguardian, we're going to this nice defensive layer for, for both us and allies, and rounding it out with Dynamo, where we're going to have that percent shred for both magical and physical damage, which we're doing a lot of damage ourselves at this point. We're doing a significant amount. And so as long as you're hitting your knockups, Belka support, build like this feels very smooth. But if you're not landing your knockups, it feels horrible. <laughs> Imagine that, hitting your abilities is good. Alright, so we have the Fey. The Fey is has solid scaling on our right click in particular, the Untamed Growth. Now, granted, it's half of its damage coming at the explosion means, again, you're very combo-oriented, similar to Bellico, though the combo is a little harder to pull off. But you can certainly do a lot of damage. The passive, admittedly, I'm not overly impressed with this passive. Achieving a takedown spawns a right click, you get some movement speed. The movement speed is nice. But overall, admittedly, Nature's Vengeance... Eh, it's okay. If you are killing someone, more than likely you are killing everyone that's there. Like, inside of that, that small of a space. And so, maybe if it reset the cooldown on your right click or something along those lines... I don't know. But anyway, the point of her kit is that she has this ultimate that groups enemies together. So ideally you want to throw out your right click, throw your ult on top of it so that you get most of the damage through that explosion. And then you're going to have the bramble patch that's going to be slowing them inside of that as well. And then harvest nettles along the way. Their landing phase, most of the time, I will say right now, your laning phase, more often than not, you're just gonna, you're not gonna level your E, your harvest nettles, until later 
in the game. It just doesn't feel very good at those early levels right now to be trying to trade super hard, especially since the range on it is not super far. More often than not, you're better off just controlling the waves. That might not be the case by the time you're seeing this video, but anyway, just something to keep in the back of your mind. The Harvest Nettles are very strong. They're great as a part of your combo, but in the early stages, it doesn't, uh, especially out of mid lane specifically, it doesn't feel like it does enough compared to just leveling ability that will help you clear the wave. All right, so mid lane, speaking of, you might have seen this build before. There's a reason for that. It's extremely strong. All right, so let's go through this real quick. Uh, mid lane, you're a, you're a burst combo-oriented mage. And with without a lot of defensive resources in your kit, so in particular, Epoch, really like this one for her. She's not really an Azure Core builder. You can do it. Uh, you can go Azure Core and you can go Soul Bearer, but you really want these older multipliers. Um, it's not bad, though. Like, you can go for this very similar build to, to what we did with Bellica. You can go for the core, but you're just keep in mind that you are delaying your power spikes by enough that it's probably not worth doing. In a longer game, though, it evens out, and you will, like, as your core is still valuable. But anyway, Epoch, de great defensive resource, as we've talked about, being able to get out of key ultimates and everything like that. Um, and even just be able to buy time for your, like, if someone's trying to sit on top of you, you can right click below you in Epoch, um, and, and force them to take the full amount of damage so that maybe it's easier for you to trade out at the very least. And then if we go in, we can look at Astral Catalyst. So since we are a combo oriented mage, we want to dump all of our spells at once. Um, Astral Catalyst rewards that heavily. And two, we are a mage that is very dependent on our ultimate. You'll see that I even have this in the support build because of how important that ultimate is. It's even more impo important to be able to play around this than, say, Gideon or Gadget because your base abilities are worse, just in general. And so... Yeah, we want to do everything that we can to push having that ultimate up as often as possible. And then race leggings, we're going to this for, in particular, the movement speed, but also the bonus damage. The bonus damage is great when you're talking about bringing the enemies in, throwing the untamed, or like untamed growth, bringing the enemies to that bramble patch. By the time the untamed growth is exploding, that you're probably getting the damage amp on the explosion, and that's that's significant. It's a lot. <laughs> At one point, I took like 1700 damage from a fake combo, and that was uh, that was painful. Oh. Um. All right. So Caustica, great option. Uh, this is what's going to give us our mana regen for the most part. The other alternative to this, though, since we are burst oriented, if you have a lot of opponents that are building that um, are building up health. Mega Cosm can go in this slot, and it will deal, if I remember correctly, 12% of the... No, that's not right. No, 12.5%. It's just 12.5. I missed a 0.5. That's all. Uh, of the opponent's... Uh, of at least one opponent's health... Um, within three seconds of your combo. Now, a bunch of that is happening during the combo itself, so Megacosm is quite strong in that regard, just because you are sequencing all four of your abilities onto someone, they're all going to deal damage to at least the one target, you know, in the case of Harvest Nettles. Um, and so especially against, say, a Rampage or something like that that's going to be building a bunch of health, Megacosm can help you actually take down an opponent like that. And Caustica is more of your general, uh, just general use, very powerful. I want the the spike of having these, this baseline level of penetration. Oblivion Crown, again, we want to burst down a target as fast as possible. So 35% bonus power, that is then the, your 
baseline power is getting increased and then it's getting multiplied by astral catalyst that combination is something that yeah just keep in mind because it's extremely potent and then spellbreaker rounding out that last little bit of just a defensive resource so that you can uh, get out of bad situations or at least give yourself a little bit of extra time to get your combo off if an opponent is trying to initiate on you you know all right, so the face solo. Now, unlike Gadget and Gideon, where you have a relatively high amount of safety, on the Fey you don't. So you really don't have as many options to build up defensive resources to buy you time to get off those kind of space-creating abilities. You are still just kind of a combo-oriented harassment mage. And so this build in particular is just kind of a bruiser route so that you can um so you can kind of push the laning phase while still having some extra durability for when an opponent gets on top of you. But then your combo is still going to do a lot of damage. So starting out Epoch, again, this is gonna be our default for the Fey, because you need that defensive resource. Soul Bearer is okay, but again, we're not really building Azure Core. You can out of Soul Lane, depending, you can make some adjustments on this so that you're getting your mana from Azure Core. You can go into Soul Bearer so that you can do that, but since we're so combo oriented, you can sometimes get some extra Harvest Nettles off and things like that in the shield, but more than likely, just buying two and a half seconds for your cooldowns is going to do a lot more in the end, at least in my opinion. But okay, so first actual item is going to be, we're going to build into the tier 2 of Leviathan, then we're going to build Time Warp, then we're going to build Astro Catalyst, and then we'll come back and finish the Leviathan. So this is just a very nice way to get a bunch of health, give us a little bit more of a pool to work with that's going to amplify our World Breaker damage. And then also give us a bunch of cooldown reduction. So we're not just randomly dying before we can get our combo off. You might still die by the time you get your combo off. But hopefully you've done enough in that time period to make it worthwhile. So, time warp. In part, this is for... This is in large part for the laning phase. And for being able to just do a little bit more outside of your ultimate. Also, pardon me, getting this ramping magical power aspect does then feed very well into the Astral Catalyst, where it's then multiplying that power that we're getting from Time Warp. So by the time you have those three items complete, you've got a solid amount of ability haste, you you're able to use your like your three abilities very very quickly and very frequently and which will help with your wave clear as well if you can you know right throw your right click on the wave use your harvest nettles on your opponent then all of a sudden you're throwing another right click really quickly and so on and so forth that's the general idea at least and worldbreaker since we went for the leviathan it's just another layer of health and then also a little bit of tenacity, so you have that ability to, even if you're getting stunned and things like that, you might still be able to have a window where you can get your combo off. And then ramping up our, our extra power from, or ramping up so that we have more power from Leviathan, and so that we can have um, it multiplied out again from Astral Catalyst. And then rounding out with Caustica. Now this one is definitely a flex slot in this build. Caustica is just nice because I, it's a very strong item. There's a very, very little that you can say that's bad about this. It's giving us... We don't really need the mana regen as much since we went into the time warp, but it's still nice to have. You're still... If you, like, are really, really spammy in those late game fights, it's still giving us that extra little boost of damage for our ultimate... But it's entirely possible that something like a Wraith Leggings might give you more value overall. It just depends on who you're hitting, how often, when, etc. If you can find really good angles into fights, then Wraith Leggings is going to do a lot still. 
We're not building as much power to go into it, but you could also potentially even go into an Oblivion Crown to round things up. A lot of different options for sure, but that mana regen aspect for me is kind of why I put uh, what pushed Caustica over over the top for the, the tail end of the game so that you can really be spammy with your Harvest Nettles in particular. All right, phase support. So I, I'm actually quite proud of this build. Um, I had I had someone who was in the stream that had requested me to play the Fey as a support, and at first I was thinking like, man, can I really pull this off in in a game like this? And this wasn't the build that I went with. I I I refined it a bit from that, and it felt surprisingly okay. You are very dependent on your ultimate, which is why you'll see that we're including as much cooldown reduction around that as we reasonably can. And then also just trying to add some little bits of extra utility to the fact that you have very low cooldowns, especially with time warp. So let's go ahead and go in and, and take a look at this, because like I said, I'm admittedly I'm kind of proud of this build. I it feels surprisingly good and just gives you a lot of opportunities to to make plays on her and actually make it work as a support. So Tranquility, this is going to be my default option. Consort, again, since we are a ranged character, we want, and someone who likes to apply a lot of pressure, you're probably going to start with your Harvest Nettles because you don't need to wave clear as a support. Consort's going to give you that bonus damage on your Harvest Nettles, help you kind of control the waves and things like that. And then Tranquility is just giving us that defensive resource that the Fae is admittedly very much lacking. When your ultimate is down, you offer very little to your allies, other than damage. And so Tranquility is giving an extra layer there so that you can buy time, you can, you know, you do have the slow from the Bramble Patch, and it's not irrelevant. It's there. It's definitely a one of the reasons why this actually can feel okay. Especially if you're playing with something like a Murdoch that can help create some of that space or a Drongo. Um, you, you can pull off a lot here. But yeah, going into Time Warp first item. This is going to allow us to be very, very spammy, especially with that. And then the nice thing here is we're going to go into a Wellspring second item. Now, this is very much still designed to push the tempo. And Wellspring, this is going to give us some early healing for... Our nearby allies, right? So 20, 20 HP per second plus 20% of your magical power. That's not irrelevant. Obviously, also, we have the Soothing Waters, um, which does require you to be hitting basic attacks to be super effective. But the nice thing here is, again, between Time Warp and Astro Catalyst and, and all of the cooldown reduction, or all of the ability haste that we are we are incorporating in here, in the, even in the early stages, you're going to be able to do a lot. Now, there is a caveat here. If you miss your Harvest Nettles too often, your mana will disappear and Wellspring will be pretty useless. As long as you are hitting those on your opponents, on the enemy, somewhat consistently, let's say 75% of the time, you will get a lot out of this build. Alright, anyway, so then going into Astral Catalyst, like I said, cooldown reduction for your ultimate in particular. Um, reducing the cooldown of your ultimate. I'm trying to not say cooldown, I'm just going to say cooldown reduction. Oh, oh well. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's ability haste, it's cooldown, it's extra mana so that you can, again, be a little bit more spammy. You can afford to miss a little bit more here and there. But really, it's for that cooldown reduction more than anything, because since it works on takedowns, those kills and assists, you can you can use that as setup, and as soon as you're getting that assist, you can you get that safety up a faster, which is very important. Crystal tier, this is kind of a nice little thing where you are getting we're co we're combining this specifically with Wellspring, so that we're boosting our own damage and ability haste. Um, every time we use an ability, as long as we are we are close enough to an ally for that healing to go off. So yeah, honestly, just kind of a fun little combination 
I will say that in this build you are extremely squishy. Just be aware that you are you are very much a counter engage unless you find a really good ultimate. And then rounding it out with Requiem, the healing and shield power is gonna boof up the uh, boof. We're gonna boof up the wellspring. <laughs> we're gonna boost up the wellspring a little bit, and then giving yourself that extra mana regen, and then magical power obviously stacking up. And most of the time, too, here at this point, the wellspring kind of falling off a little bit. But then you have the ability to to give your ADC in particular a boost in lifesteal. And at this point, if you are you are fully six slotted, your ADC likely is as well. And you're in good shape. Granted, this build is relatively cheap, so you might hit it even a little bit before some of the more expensive ADC builds, but you get the idea that you are giving that boost of survivability to your allies and getting some extra burst damage inside of your kit. Now, one thing I do want to mention, Dynamo is a pretty solid option in here as well that you could run instead of the Requiem if you are up against multiple really tanky targets that that are dive heavy. So say you have a tank Grux and a tank Chimera or a, or and a tank Rampage. Let's even say you have three. You can go for the Dynamo so that you can land that ult on all of them and make it easier to actually get through those like big beefy boys. And that's definitely something you can consider replacing Requiem with. It is important to remember that it only triggers off your ultimate, so it is a little bit of a, it is very much a situational, like you need your ultimate to be going on those tanky targets. And then last but not least, Dreambinder is a great other resource. Maybe you could run it, run it over the crystal tier to add some slows into your kit, your baseline kit, so that you have a little bit more control. Um, to offer your allies in terms of creating space. All right, we're hitting the home stretch here. So Crunch, my man, he loves to punch. Crunch is really, really cool because he has both physical and magical power scaling in his kit. One thing you want to keep in mind, though, his auto attack after his abilities deals magic damage, but his abilities themselves deal physical damage. And this is important because things like Flux Matrix or or ability things like that or World Breaker, not good on Crunch. Physical damage. He has magical power scaling, but it does physical damage. Keep that in mind. That's one of the key things that I think is is really, really important. To just remember. <laughs> so the combo oriented, you really want to make sure with all of Crunch's builds that you were weaving in your auto attacks. So, you know, ideally you dash, you get that little micro stun, you get an auto attack. You, you know, uh, you, da, 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 what is it? Left Crunch, so you're getting the little AoE. You get your auto attack in. You right Crunch, so that you're getting the uppercut, and then you get your auto attack in. You really need to get those auto attacks in as often as possible between your abilities. You can't just run in <laughs> ability 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 you will miss on so much damage even just from his base kit so keep that in mind you need to weave those auto attacks in i've seen people like they they they're going in on crunch they're not getting those auto attacks in they're just like combo 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 i've even done it at times when i'm not like when I'm a little bit tired and things like that. And then I'm like, oh man, I I probably could have, you know, probably could have killed that person or probably could have had a better fight if I just remembered I need to actually get those left clicks in in between. So speaking of weaving in autos, we have a delightful Crunch Jungle build here that is, this is very much an assassin style build. You are going to have some sustain and everything like that, both from your base kit and from some of the things that we build. You can build Crunch a little bit more hybrid, but as of right now, I would say that you're more often than not, you just want damage and maybe a defensive resource like the Salvation, maybe the Draconum, something along those lines. But if you lean too heavily into that, you're going to just lose a lot. In the process. So let's take a look at his first uh, his crest here. Uh, let me get this pulled up. 
So, Phoenix. This is a really cool item that I talked a little bit about in the in the very first bi the build video that you can do a lot of kind of tricky things with it and things like that. But honestly, it's a lot easier to use than I thought it would be because most of the time you can just trigger it as you're about to die. And as long as you can do something, do enough with that 40% HP and everything that you're getting, which there are even some items that combo right that, right? 40%, keep that number in mind. Demon Edge, things like that. Anyway point is that as you're coming out of that as long as you have enough of your kit available when when you come back out you can do a lot with that revive now the other good thing too is if you can make a lot of space between yourself and that point so say you run into the enemy team especially with crunch you right click into the enemy team Say you set your your uh, your point, you double crunch in, and then all of a sudden, you know, yes, you're going to get burst down and everything, but you come back, you force them to use resources to focus on you, the rest of your team has closed the gap, all of a sudden, a lot of good things are happening. So, just Phoenix is just a really cool item to play around, and can be extremely effective. Now, the nice thing about Crunch is that we get to build Oathkeeper and Painweaver. So, even though he's dealing physical damage, he has magical power scaling in all of his, his abilities and his passive. So, we get to build both of these items to amplify his punches. Again, this is why that we're playing into that weave play style, where you need to you know, get your get your autos in between everything, like I was talking about before. But with Painweaver in particular and Oathkeeper, we also get with Painweaver, sorry, in particular, we are also getting additional damage based on the target's missing health. So again, that that dash in, you know, maybe you dash your auto you get your your right crunch and then you re crunch for the uppercut just so that you can get the really swift knockout and then you get that auto attack in afterwards this is going to be doing even more bonus damage because they're at half health or less or something along those lines so it just allows for this kind of instant burst to come through that just does a lot and then mutilator this is going to pair very well with the sustain that is already in crunch's kit we're getting some omni vamp here we're getting uh bonus health that we're stealing from our opponents excellent especially if you as you can move from target to target to target in the later stages of the game um overall there's just and you're dealing percent health damage as well which can help you actually fight against something like a rampage or something along those lines if if you need to if you are struggling to you know or if they get in between you or if you already taken out one of the squishier targets things like that next up we're going to go into an omen this is playing into that burst idea so omen is really great for characters in particular that want to engage with some sort of mobility tool whether it's Kalari's Stealth, Fang Mao's Jump, or Crunch's Dash. What is this dash called? Uh, forward Crunch. Crunch is a wonderful dork. Anyway, Forward Crunch. This allows you, like, when, once you're at these max stacks, you can Forward Crunch in, you can get that auto attack and reduce that. Or even if you need to, Forward Crunch, like right crunch and then uppercut you're re-crunching then at least in that auto attack that you get off both of the the forward crunch and the right crunch the cooldowns are getting reduced by both this and your passive right so you'll be able to more quickly be able to combo again and, and actually stay on top of an opponent even if it, it gives you just a little bit more uh forgiveness inside of your combo system and then last but not least rounding out with a where are you vanquisher uh 
you're not as expensive as I thought. Okay. Running out with a Vanquisher, this is just really nice to make sure that you actually can confirm those kills. Crunch does a ton of damage. It's not like he needs a lot of help with this, but there are definitely times where you're just that little bit off. Plus, honestly, getting the bonus power, he can do a lot with that bonus power. And having a little bit more ability haste on top of the Pain Weaver, the Manipulator, everything else that's going on here. It just it all comes together very well. Alright, so Crunch in the offlane. This one we are going for a little bit more durability. Now, I put this example in here as a way that you could still build a little bit of hybrid and still have a lot of potential power, especially in the early stages of the game, while giving you a little more flexibility in being an engage. Because oftentimes you're offlane, sometimes you're jungle, but oftentimes your offlane and your support are the ways that you are starting fights. So especially if you're playing crunch in the offlane, you want a little bit more durability toward the end of the game. So you can still be that first person in and, and not just get instantly deleted. So with this, uh, we are taking a look. Let's um, crest. We're going to go into Icecorn Talons. Now, granted, you can still go into the Phoenix. You can go into one of the magical power options. Obviously, Obelisk is great for being able to weave in those auto attacks. Your rogue options are still perfectly viable here. Witch Stalker in particular is extremely powerful on him. Um, but Icecorn Talons, I just kind of want to highlight this one because you're getting a damage amp. Um, and overall... It just does a lot. Being able to stay on top of a target for a longer time period um, helps since we are not building as much damage as we would be otherwise. So our first item, we're going to go into the Tier 2, the uh, Lock Shawl of Leviathan. Then we're going to build Oathkeeper, then Mutilator. And you can reverse those if you're in a really aggressive matchup like a Grox or something along those lines where you need the extra healing first. You can definitely go Mutilator, then Oathkeeper. And then we're going to go ahead and come back and finish the Leviathan. This is going to give us that nice big boost in health, decent amount of cooldown reduction, and really just set up all of our other resources so that we don't have to build into the, in particular, the physical armors that have health attached to them necessarily. You still can, but we can go for the more aggressive option here. Oh, this has health on it. For some reason, I didn't think it did. All right. Well, whatever. So we're building into the, um, I guess I could show the other items here. Building into the Mutilator so that we can have the Omni Vamp and the Ability Haste, plus just that percent health damage, especially in a solo lane matchup, does a lot. On Crunch in general, it does a lot. So, um, and then we're going to go opt into the Oath Keeper. Although I do admit, now that I'm thinking about it, there might be a chance, just a chance, that Oathkeeper is not as strong necessarily as Pain Weaver. We might have to do some math around that at some point. Pain Weaver might actually be better than Oathkeeper as is as a standalone. I haven't actually tried it yet. Well, I might have to do some math there. Something that uh, that I can say that you guys can do at home. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so Citadel. This is a nice one. We're going to be reducing opponent's um, physical armor. So as I mentioned, all of Crunch's abilities are physical damage. So we want to opt into the Citadel for that AoE shred. Or for the shred to nearby he heroes, I should say. Um, this is just going to help increase our power while giving us that big boost in physical armor. I mean, potentially up to 85. Obviously, that's not going to happen very often. But even just sitting at 55 or something along those lines, again, it gives you more flexibility to be able to dash in and do more as an initiator rather than having to, to play as that assassin where you're being patient, where you are waiting for your other people to do that. And then Unbroken Will is a nice way to round this out where we're getting this great defensive resource for when we're stunned. 
you know, that percent damage reduction is massive. Getting a decent chunk of health out of it as well, and then a little bit of magical armor to be able to mitigate some of the incoming damage from the mages. Basically, again, just, just a pair of items rounding out the build where most of our durability is going to come from that big pool of health that we're getting from Leviathan and the healing that we're getting from our kit and mutilator. But as the game goes on, that's really not enough for us to be able to, again, be the person who's starting fights. So next up is Feng Mao. And Feng Mao feels like he's in a little bit of an odd spot to me, personally. <laughs> but. He has a ton of potential. He's got great physical power scaling in his kit, both for his shield and for the bonus movement speed that he gets, and then also for his ultimate, both in the damage that it deals and the execute, which granted the execute is really what we care about. So for him, between the caring about most about the execute and then also the passive of dealing bonus damage based on the uh, target's current health, when he hasn't taken damage for a period of time so his his initial he he plays very well as an assassin and we're definitely going to lean pretty heavily on that in the builds and everything because your your durability your kit just doesn't lend itself very well to that at least in my experience so far tried to theory craft some some more durable builds especially for offlane in particular but he really is a physical burst character that wants to jump in, get that like big auto attack off, hamstring, auto, you know, ult, and then safeguard and run away. <laughs> That's definitely how he feels right now. And if you get stunned or anything like that at any point during this, you're probably dead because your base stats are, are they feel... And and I, I might I have not actually looked at his base health compared to other characters, but it feels like he is weaker for some reason. Now granted, that could just be me. I have seen Feng Mao's go pop off crazy, especially with the assassin style of play, and I say I think he shines, but I've yet to see one who does well with more of that kind of bruiser brawler or even tank style. That one seems really underwhelming, and that's okay. It's great for him to have an identity as an assassin, but you want to keep that in the back of your mind, because especially if you're coming from Paragon or something like that, where you could build hybrid, where you had a lot of flexibility in how you build Feng Mao, you won't really see that in, in Predecessor, at least in my opinion. All right, so out of the jungle again, we're going to be playing a very assassin-style build where you are focused on getting in getting in those getting into a fight getting off those few key attacks and then getting out whether or not you kill someone in that process you're certainly hoping to and you're hoping to get the resets on your ultimate and everything you have to be really patient in order to make a lot of that happen but let's take a dive into the example build here so witch soccer uh oops let me hit this button there we go Witch Soccer, this is a great item for dealing with CC, which is something Feng Mao has a really hard time with. Like I said, for some reason, it feels like he is less durable than other characters even building as this assassin, other than maybe Kalari. It feels... It, but anyway, so he is weak to CC especially since his mobility can be interrupted and everything like that. And so having the Witch Soccer, it's just a really nice tool to be able to make sure that, yes, I can I can get in, I can get my damage off that I need to, I can get that ultimate, and I can get out. And we're going to build more around some of those kind of tools. Another way to do this, though, is Phoenix. Phoenix is also excellent on him. Or going for next so that you can save your dash. Or just have another set of mobility in general to be able to have more flexibility in how you get around and navigate a fight. The build itself is relatively straightforward. We're going into a malady first item. This is going to help us a little bit with our clear. He doesn't need a ton of help. His, wave, his uh, clear in the jungle is actually fairly strong. 
But the reason that we're building this first, one, it's a relatively cheap power spike, and two, we really want to stack this passive. So the way this item works, Demise, dealing damage to an enemy below 45% HP, gives you, uh, deals bonus damage, and every time that triggers, it, um, it, the, the, the bonus damage increases. And especially since you can get this, you know, four, five minutes into the game, it's really easy to start stacking this very, very quickly as you're rotating around the wings and everything like that and be dealing 200 bonus damage toward the end game, which is a pretty significant chunk when you are just trying to get someone into that execute threshold. And two, as soon as you do execute someone with your ult, that ability resets so you can get the bonus damage multiple times in a fight especially for feng mao where he has that execute like i said that and it, it is a takedown so kill or assist will reset it but it's easier to confirm again also a reasonably high uh power item and then next we'll go into a mutilator so this is going to give us some sustain in the jungle itself um, just make the jungling aspect r relatively easy and make your 1v1s a little smoother. Because especially, like, Feng Mao can box 1v1 fairly well against a lot of characters. Now, granted, a little weak to things like Crunch and Grux at the moment, but I imagine that will even out with the first balance patch. Um, but giving the percent health damage as well, where, again, all, all of this is around getting as much damage out as quickly as possible to get in that ult range before your opponent can truly react to it. So in that vein, we are going into the Omen. So with this, at the moment, I believe his E is not, uh, his hamstring is not giving the proper amount of cooldown reduction on his dash. But even if it was, what Omen allows you to do is dash in, hamstring, auto attack and be able to hamstring more quickly um after that point granted you know i mean it's 1.5 second cooldown reduction and that's pretty big in this case and especially once his dash once the cooldown on his dash is properly reduced or the tooltip is fixed or whatever it's going to give you that dash much more quickly as well so you can dash in you can you can hamstring, you can auto attack, you've got this big burst of damage that's coming from that, and then still be able to have some safety in getting out. Next up, Pain Weaver. This is a great spike a uh, little bit later in the build because it's in part based on the amount of bonus physical power that you have. Um, and unlike Crunch, we're not really stacking, like, yes, we're not stacking the Oathkeeper and this, so the, the like, increase in damage is really just amplifying what he does already for feng mao we really want the power behind it so that he's getting that burst on that extra first auto attack and and ramping that up as quickly as possible um and again with this and the omen it's very easy to dash in hit the auto attack get the hamstring and be or or like dash in hamstring auto attack and be able to get your pain weaver from your shield while everything else is coming through so your timing on this you do kind of want to get into a decent rhythm where you're trying to get those pain weaver auto attacks but again more burst damage just trying to get to um just trying to get to that execute threshold and then last but not least, Mesmer. So this is a more physical pen, more power, a little bit of magical armor, which is good. It makes your shield a little bit more valuable against some of those like poke effects and things like that when you're sieging. If you're having trouble like not getting caught by those, or if you can't really stand in a safe place, or if you're just trying to be really aggressive. And then also, obviously, the spell shield. This is great for when you're going in against, say, a Murdoch in particular, where he can't push you away immediately, or where the support can't just immediately stun you off. Um, nice layer of safety. And two, this is something with a lot of these. This, If you find yourself having a lot of trouble with that, say, against a Decker or a Narbash or something along those lines, you can absolutely build this earlier. 
Um, I would still build Malady and Mutilator first so that you have those big damage spikes, but you could absolutely go into a Mesmer third and adjust the build accordingly. Um, but having that layer of safety, again, as someone who is so weak to CC, really important. Thing about offlane is I okay, so I admit this is very much a theory craft, this example build. I really wanted to focus in on that 1v1 brawler aspect because that is where Feng Mao kind of shines. Not in every matchup, but once he has a couple of items under his belt, pardon me, I wanted to give him at least as much of a chance as possible to be able to box, to use the shields as best as he can without really going too far away from his identity as an assassin. So here, if we take a look, opting into the phoenix um oh there we go so opting into the phoenix so that we have the revive so that some like i said some of those 1v1 matchups are extremely difficult or if you're in a 1v2 situation this gives you more wiggle room to outplay your opponents i do think phoenix is very valuable i think ice scorn is okay I think it's less good on him than on some of the other characters, but it still can be valuable. And you can also just go into the rogue options and go for more of a straight assassin setup and eschew some of these like more um, lifesteal-oriented sustain options. So, speaking of, next we are going into the Mutilator. And what the Mutilator is going to do is get a percent health damage. A lot of the times in the solo lane, you're going to be dealing someone who's building health. This gives you some actual kill threat, along with just helping you sustain in the laning phase, which is difficult at times, especially with an option like the, like, especially if you go with the Rogue Crest or something along those lines. Now, Nightfall, again, pushing that 1v1 idea, he does benefit quite a bit from ability haste. The attack speed certainly doesn't hurt. And then getting the Omni Vamp is really the part that we care about. Because you can dash in, auto attack, hamstring, and have the Omni Vamp active for your next several auto attacks. Um, not last for five seconds, so even if you like dash in, hamstring, auto attack, and, and you get Grux pulled, right? you're stunned for a moment, whatever, you're still going to be able to get your shield off and start auto-attacking and still have the Omni Vamp uh, up and running from this. And then you're stacking out with the Omni Vamp from Mutilator as well. It's hopefully just going to do enough to be able to keep you, keep you in those fights that would otherwise be really difficult. And then, okay, so here next, Omen, as I was talking about a little bit with the jungle version of the build, this is going to help you reset your cooldowns, and especially, I don't know if the uh, the hamstring tooltip is wrong or if the amount of cooldown is incorrect, but either way, this is going to kind of help mitigate the fact that you don't have a dash reset, not really at least, um, and it's also just going to give you that little bit of burst damage, and two, since we're working with Omni Vamp as a large part of our sustain, as a large part of where we're getting our durability is the Omni Vamp and then the bigger shields from building a lot of physical power, um, you get to really push how much you're getting from the Omni Vamp, from your abilities. Because you will have decent burst damage from those, and the more often that you can use them, the more effective that will really be. And the next, again, we're kind of pushing this this lifesteal idea. So once you drop below 40% HP, you get 10% on you, ma'am. So at this point, you're sitting at like 28%, I think. It's a lot. It's a lot of healing. And especially as a Feng Mao, if you don't have someone on your team, like a Narabash or something like that, people might not be building anti-heal. In your 1v1 matchups, if they don't realize what you're doing, they may not build anti-heal. You can definitely get um, get a lot out of that Omni Vamp when you when you drop below, and then all of a sudden you're you're two thirds health again after after a hamstring and an auto. Uh, right, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but you get the general idea. And the last but not least, is not least, we're continuing with that theme, and we're going to salvation. So we don't have a ton of max health for this to be a massive shield, but 
when he hit that 40% mark, all of a sudden we're going to have 20% extra Omni Vamp and a shield. That Hopefully that shield will get us through whatever CC that we're up against so that we can then use the Omni Vamp to heal back up above that you know 50% mark or whatever. Basically so we can take good trades in the later stages of the game once damage has kind of ramped up a little bit. And we can still then have the opportunity. It's still a good chunk of physical power. It's a de it's a really big chunk of health on its own. That's one of the nice things about Salvation. Um, so, general idea. You're just getting this nice big shield. Getting more Omni Vamp. Again, we're up to almost 40%. That's a lot. That's a lot of healing. So, keep that in mind both playing with and against Feng Mao. Especially out of the offlane. That you have this option of going this like heavy lifesteal route. So you can really try and push the what your shield can do. Again, this build is weak to CC, which is why something like a Legacy or um, something like Absolution, there's a non-crit version of Absolution, um, but those kind of effects that cleanse you once you're hitting that 40% health mark, you could certainly run something like that over the Omen in particular. Or you could go into a more defensive route. Like I said, I haven't been very impressed with the defensive route, but you might have more success. I'm not a great Fang Mao player. I never really was. People that I'm working with also like have had some success with this style of play, that assassin style. But definitely, you know, we'll keep the builds updated as as I learn from people who are better than I am. Alright, so Kalari. Realistically, Kalari can be played in the jungle and the offlane, but you're going to build very similarly. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, originally, when I was putting this together, I really only put together jungle builds. So I'm like, what's the difference, really? But there is a little bit. There are some subtle things, so we'll talk about that. But, okay, so we have really strong physical power scaling. So building into that physical power definitely does a lot. You have multiple daggers, right? The cooldown, especially once it's maxed out, is really low. So you have a lot of poke opportunity. You also just have a lot of burst opportunity. Um, and I mean, the general idea, right, is that you want to shadow walk in. Like, death, like, dagger, death mark, dagger, ult, auto, and they're dead. That's kind of, you know, right? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. It doesn't usually work out that way. But okay. You have really solid mobility. So don't forget the that you can change direction while you are in mid-air. Something really, really useful to be able to get on top of walls or to dodge key abilities as they're coming at you. This double jump is very, very powerful. But overall, you are just a burst assassin. It really wants to deal as much damage as possible and then and then get out with the jump into turning invisible. To your invisibility, it does take a little bit of time, right? 1.5 seconds for that to activate. Keep that in the back of your mind that this isn't a safety tool. Not really, at least. Yes, you can sometimes use it to get out of bad situations, but especially since everyone has wards, the delay on this can be especially punishing. So be really, really careful with how you're using that and, and don't rely on it to get you out of a bad situation. Use your jump, use your blink. If you really have to, use your ultimate to create that distance instead because you can still do a lot with your base kit in terms of damage. All right, so Clary out of the jungle. We're going for just pure assassin. It's where she shines. There's... Some really fun kind of cool builds that you can do, like a mana crit build and things like that, that I think could be really potent. But Kalari, there's kind of two two key components that you want to be able to get into the fight, take out a key target, and then leave. So we've got some resources specifically for that. And then also being able to stay on top of a key target is really important. So to that end, we are going to opt into and next. So this is going to give us that extra dash, and then that that also can do bonus damage, which is not irrelevant for Kalari. You can definitely use this to finish off opponents, but most of the time this is going to be the way that you close the gap after a Murdoch pushback, or after someone is jumping jumping around, or whatever. Or even if you just need that little bit of extra space, 
to get into the right position in a fight at the right time or take advantage of someone being out of place quickly enough, Nex really does a lot for Kalari in terms of just being able to do that. So similar to Feng Mao, we really want that, that burst damage to come through. Going into Malady, this is going to give us a, a stacking set of damage that will occur over time, as well as speeding up our clear a little bit. Clary's clear isn't terrible, but it's also not as good as, say, a Rampage or something along those lines. Or a, a Chimera with Overlord. So Malady is going to speed that up a little bit and give us that nice stacking, ramping damage that Really, with this, the nice thing, too, is it's any damage, so it can uh, trigger as a part of your, um, what is it called? Death mark, that one. That mark, uh, that detonate can trigger that damage, so you can really catch people off guard with how much they're going to take when that goes off. So, just something to keep in the back of your mind. Vanquisher, this is giving us, as you can see in a lot of this, We've got a lot of power coming through, we've got Ability Haste, and then once again, that mark, if it triggers, leaves them below 5%, with the Malady, they're dead. So, we're giving even more wiggle room on, on how precise you need to be in order to actually eliminate someone, and I think that is very strong. Omen, this is great. You know, despite what I said about the... Sh the uh, Shadow Walk not necessarily being the best defensive tool, being able to use it, go in, dagger auto, dagger, and then very shortly after that have your invisibility coming back off cooldown. You know, if you can jump up and start that Shadow Walk and everything, it can definitely get you out of a lot, but a lot of bad situations. So, Omen, very strong. Again, just more burst damage really try and get them into that range for the Malady Vanquisher to finish them off. Painweaver, similar idea. We are going in, we're getting that, you know, again, you're, most of the time you are shadow walking into a fight, or you're using your dagger to get things started. So naturally you really feel comfortable doing that ability auto, ability auto, ability auto, see, pardon me, sequence. Painweaver is just going to add more burst into that setup and really kind of hopefully push it again over the edge for that Malady Vanquisher combo. And then last but not least, Mesmer. We're very CC uh, <laughs> averse, let's say. Really don't want it, especially as Kalari. Kalari is definitely the squishiest character in the game, and understandably so. Extremely high damage. She's an assassin. It makes sense. Feels very good, to be honest. But having that bubble can, again, help you actually get your jumps off. It can help you get into the Shadow Realm when you need to. It can get you out of a bad situation with a bunch of wards and things like that. So, just something to keep in mind. Nice defensive layer. Most of the rest of the build, it's, it's that Malady Vanquisher setup that really, I think, feels incredibly strong. Alright, so Kalari offlane, what's the difference here? For the most part... We're still relying on the Vanquisher to play that kind of assassin style, but we're using some extra tools to help with wave clear and to help give us some sustain in those 1v1 fights. And then also leaning a little bit away from Malady just because it, while you can still stack it and everything like that, fighting in the 1v1 in the solo lane is extremely difficult in those early stages. So most of the time, you're just not going to get enough out of it to justify taking that over some of the other options. So first up, we're still going into the into next, into the Rogue Crest. You can opt into something like the Icecorn Talons, especially if you build more of a lifesteal style build, like that Feng Mao build that we talked about last time. You could do something very similar to that, where you go into the Nightfall and things like that instead of the Mind Razor. Um, Mind Razor, the nice thing about this is it's going to give you really solid clear. Also, the Mind Razor passive and Vanquisher passive, despite the fact that they have the same name, they do in fact stack. So, just something to keep in mind that we're going to get a lot of power out of this build, and we're just getting that nice AoE damage, which lets us fight inside the wave a little more effectively. 
and really allows us to push a little bit harder, a little bit faster in that 1v1 matchup. You really have to play very defensively in those early stages, but as soon as you have this online, you at least have some boxing potential. Similarly, Mutilator, we're going to lean on this to get that damage, the damage that we actually need in that 1v1 matchup, and the sustain that we need for farming consistently. So once you have this and you have the Mind Razor online, you can go and invade the jungle. You can, you know, obviously you can fight inside that wave a lot more easily. You can fight your opponents a lot more easily, just in general. And then we're going to lean into Dread. And this, okay, admittedly, I have mixed feelings on this, but I like the Dread Vanquisher combination. It is entirely possible that Omen in particular is just better. But here I wanted to lean, into, lean on this just because the auto combat movement speed allows you to get around the map a little bit faster and since you want to be rotating as an assassin or you know picking when when you're coming into the lane and everything like that you aren't you don't you aren't roaming as freely necessarily and you have to be able to get back to be able to defend structures that's what i'm trying to say Dread will give you that little extra bonus to movement speed so that you can do that. And then also the restoration of health, you know, this applies to minions. So again, being able to fight inside those minion waves actually box when you're in the lane itself. That part is great. And if you end up in a 1v2 situation, Dread can give you a lot of room for outplays, especially once you have the Vanquisher online. His Vanquisher, again, we're getting that Execute once they reach that certain point. We don't have the same level of burst damage to get there, because uh, we're not combining it with the stacking damage from Malady and everything like that, and we have a little bit less... We still have a decent chunk of power and everything, but the passives in particular are much more sustain-oriented or farm-oriented. But this still allows us to to take out those those opponents and win very close fights because that's what you're going to be in most of the time. <laughs> um, and then last but not least here, you're going into the Mesmer just to round out again. Kalari hates CC. If you can dodge even one piece of it, you are you are very happy. Or rather, if you can prevent one piece of it that would otherwise hit you. Because you do get to dodge a lot of CC, let's be honest. Between the jumps, between being able to get in invisibly, and everything like that. So hopefully this will, will at least give some inspiration in some different directions to go. I will be honest, you can just go that straight assassin route and everything like that. Build her just like you would out of the jungle, but you have to play accordingly. So this gives you a bit more of an actual offlane feel, while still being that... Tr true to the core identity of a Kalari Assassin. Alright, next up is Chimera. So, Chimera is all about health sustain in his kit, and all about dealing a lot of on-hit damage very, very fast during Unleash. That's really the two things that you want to play around, is that he has a ton of health, and then these five auto attacks, the base damage of them is not your actual base damage. It's going to be significantly lower that. However, it applies all of the on-hit effects. So there are a lot of different ways that you can take advantage of that, both out of the jungle and offlane. And he really does benefit from being fairly durable. You can build him for pure damage, you can build him just to be a burst assassin style character, but so far the ones that really seem to be able to run over an enemy team, especially when they forget to buy anti-heal, are the ones that are the, the more health bruiser style that are focused on that kind of on-hit effect through Unleash, and it can be a monstrous amount of damage even with that. So Chimera out of the jungle, we are going to be a little more damage oriented in this in this, just because most of the time when you're playing out of the jungle, you really want when you show up to a lane for there to be a lot of kill potential. And that's something that uh, for all of these jungle builds, I really wanted to lean on rather than going for a full tank variation or something along those lines. But let's be honest, Kai also with all of this just works all of the 
all of these items just work very well with what Kai wants to do anyway, with this more health bruiser style, really pumping invigorate of giving you giving you more wiggle room and more opportunities for Unleash to really come through. So, Chimera Phoenix, honestly, this has been a very impressive item to me. All of the crests are an option, though. I have, We've done Phoenix, we've done Ice Scorn, we've done Nex, we've done Witch Soccer. I don't know that we've done Ortis yet, but Ortis also very strong for resetting Unleash and things like that. Basically, though, the Phoenix just gives you that second life so you can build... So you can deal with the fact that there is so much percent health damage and everything like that inside of the game. And that reset does do some for Chimera. Obviously, you're going to lose your stacks and everything like that from your passive, but it buys time for Ambush to come back online, for Unleash to come back online, and everything like that. So it can, it still does quite a bit in, in buying you time and, and figuring out how much more you can do in a team fight once you have that reset. Overlord, this is what's going to make your clear ungodly fast. Overlord is a great item on a, on a couple of people, Chimera and Rampage in particular. And again, it fits into that idea of, okay, we're going to build a bunch of health, we're going to get some extra bonus on hit damage on our auto attacks, which includes Unleash, so that we can we can really push how much damage we're getting in Unleash, even though we're not dealing that base level of auto attack damage. Then next, I, I know we've seen this item a lot recently, and to be fair, it's just insanely good. Mutilator, very difficult to go wrong with this. Very difficult once you have this online for other junglers to actually box into you, just because... Again, you can trigger it very, very quickly. You get the Omni Vamp to heal off of your ultimate. You have healing inside of your kit. So honestly, like if you are up against a Chimera, build your anti-heal second item. You know, build your wave clear item and everything like that, but build your anti-heal second. Because especially once this is online, it is very, very difficult to actually deal with him. Because you don't have the burst yet to actually kill him before that lifesteal matters especially in a 1v1 situation. So, Anteil early against Chimera. Omnivamp. So, even with that that said, as a Chimera, you can still get a lot of value out of this. It just makes the fight more even when they have Anteil, but if you find someone who doesn't, they're, they're free game at that point. And so then from this, we can go into Augmentation. So again, so, admittedly, the attack speed outside of Unleash is still relevant because we're building all of these on-hit effects. The movement speed with your ultimate, you have six seconds of it. It's pretty strong. Helps you stay on top of opponents if they're not already dead. Or if they manage to... Or if you miss your ultimate. Um, but anyway, I digress. Again, it's just another... It's true damage on hit. And so this is going to allow us to not care as much about some of the other, um, some not care as much about physical armor and everything like that. And at this point, we've got that true damage built in. We're getting five, like a lot of damage, a lot of bonus damage on your unleash at this point between those three items. And then we're going to amp it up even more with Basilisk. Now Basilisk is... A little bit interesting because most of the time you will have your stacks finished by the time Unleash is done, like your first Unleash, because you can jump in, you can auto Unleash, and then auto, and your that last auto attack is really what's going to be, you, you'll get one in your Unleash, and then the last auto attack that you're getting off um, will deal that, that bonus damage. But the nice thing is here, again, if you jump, you Unleash, you ult, and then you start autoing again, they've got a lot of missing health, and they've got their armor stripped by 30%, which this reduction also is amping up the damage of your allies and everything like that. So very, very strong effect, very, very potent. And again, you can apply it relatively quickly. Salvation is a nice way to round this out. It's going to give us that little bit of extra Omni Vamp, Plus, we've built so much health. 
every single one of these items has health on it. So the shield that you're getting here is pretty huge. And especially, you know, being able to keep getting jumps, keep getting unleashes, the more often that you can get those things off, or the more of them you can get off, the easier your fights are. Salvation just gives you that extra kind of panic button. It helps to mitigate some of the, the pain of anti-heal in the late stages of the game. And two, this is something where you can definitely swap the Basilisk and Salvation if you're not worried about damage, uh, the amount of damage you're dealing, but the amount of damage you're taking instead. You can definitely flip those around, adjust how you need to inside of this build, though I will say that you should pretty much always build Overlord first just to speed up your clear, because it does get very fast once you have that online. So, offlane Chimera. This example build in particular, I leaned very heavily on the tank aspect of Chimera. Using Ice Scorn to take, stay on top of opponents. Let's, let's dive into the, the build itself. Let me get the items going here. Originally, I was planning to talk a little more before I did, but <laughs> there's not a whole lot else to say. You can build him the same exact way that you build out of the jungle, and you can definitely just opt into... Um, you know, maybe a little more defensive option may go Draconum instead of a Basilisk, something along those lines. But this style of build allows you to really sustain and wave clear in those 1v1 fights where you really shine. And just kind of run down solo lane a lot until you're ready to start rotating for Fangtooth and things like that. Once you're like 2-ish items in at that 12-15 minute mark. But before that point, it's difficult for a lot of solo laners to actually keep up with you. Granted, it can be done, but it's it's kind of a skill matchup at that point when you're going for this more kind of defensive route that will give you more flexibility and, all right, yeah, I have all of this healing, I have a bunch of power right up front. It's been very effective for me so far. So, okay, so Overlord. As we, can, as we talked about in Jungle, this item is nuts on, on Chimera and Rampage in particular. Where are you? Hold on. Let's narrow this search a little bit. There we go. All right. <laughs> so Overlord AoE auto attacks helps tremendously with your clear, makes it very difficult for your opponents to fight into a wave against you. They kind of have to walk past their own wave, which is not a bad thing, but and a lot of times that'll be the right choice regardless, but makes it very difficult for that. Gives you the percent on, on hit damage. Overall, just great on Chimera. So then as we look at our second item here, Draconum, this one is really unique. I think there are probably more heroes that can take advantage of this than I've really and truly evaluated, particularly because of the, the flow side of the passive. But even with Crunch and things like that, it's possible that he could use this really well because he has the healing from his abilities once he has his ultimate. So the, the core idea here, though, for Chimera is that every time you deal damage, you're getting physical power, which is going to increase the damage of Unleash because there is some physical damage scaling there. It's going to increase the damage of your jump. And then it's also going to increase your... your actually, hold on. Nope, okay. That's it. <laughs> and his ultimate. And then you're gaining that percent increased healing, right? So this is both take and dealing damage. You're getting these stacks. Getting the 10 stacks is not difficult at all. And then the takedowns restoring a percentage of your missing health is fantastic. The attack speed is great for when you um, are in between unleash effects. It can help you really keep your damage actually going. And, you know, very similar to that, we then also have augmentation. So again, movement speed from your ultimate lasts for six seconds. So it's really, really strong to be able to stay on top of an opponent after you ult them. Um, makes it very hard for them to get away from you. And then bonus on hit true damage. So we're ramping up the damage of Unleash really significantly by the time we have augmentation. Now, in this particular build, for the offlane, I opted to go into a little bit more defenses. So, Legacy. Legacy works really, really well with Chimera because he wants... His health will 
fluctuate down and then back up because you're going to take a lot of initial damage. Your regen is going to amp back, ramp up, and so you'll start healing it back up after you've taken a certain amount. So with this, it's giving you another cleanse, which having two is a lot. You can get out of a lot of situations with that and keep fighting through a lot of bad things. And then also alongside of that, we're going to gain some physical power based on missing health. So again, this idea that if we have 60% missing health, we get a bunch of physical power, we can potentially just overpower our opponents between the Legacy and the Draconum and the like damage amp that we're getting at that point before they can actually finish us off. And then last but not least, rounding out with uh, some nice physical defenses, some additional physical defenses. Warden's Faith is a great option. The cooldown reduction for your basic abilities is great. Now, granted, Citadel, also an excellent option. I don't remember if that's in the situational setup or not. It should be. <laughs> um, because, you know, shredding your uh, allies... Well... Nope, okay. Added. <laughs> so it's correct in the spreadsheet. But anyway, so Citadel... Obviously, shredding opponents' physical defenses nearby, this is going to amp up the damage of Overlord and of just the rest of your kit, um, and gives you some really, really strong options, just as another choice instead of the Warden's Faith. Okay, so Grux, he has been one of the standout heroes for sure. Definitely feels extremely strong. Um, there are some interesting things that we have to note about his kit. One, his bleed does not trigger damage effects, so that's something to know that the bleed is there, it's its own separate thing, but it doesn't trigger things like corrode. Um, the Omnivamp is something that's definitely very valuable and something you want to keep in mind, that the, the stacks of Bloodlust, the stacks of your passive, giving you that Omnivamp is extremely powerful, and the other kind of key thing to keep in mind with him is that your double pain triggers basic attack effects, but it does not, because like it's, okay, so the way it reads, right, on hit effects, is it ability on hit effects, is it basic attack on hit effects? It's basic attack on hit effects. Infernum, for instance, does not double proc for him. His basic attack effects, like, Bonesaw, which you're going to see a lot of, and Augmentation, and things like that. Those kind of on-hit effects are what actually are there in Double Pain, but it doesn't count as an auto-attack, so the AoE effects from things like Mind Razor and Overlord do not apply. Just some kind of clarifications around how that works, because it definitely took a lot of testing for me to be able to figure some of that out. Because initially in that first build, I threw in front of him in there because I'm like, I don't know what's, I don't know what on hit means in this case. Originally in Paragon, it was basic attack on hits, but in this one, it wasn't super clear. So hopefully that gives you some clarification. Let's jump into the builds. So out of the jungle, most of the time you are build, you can build as a straight assassin, but Grux really shines at being able to control his his opponents for an extended period and be able to really deal a lot of damage through his right click. And with this particular example build, that's what we're leaning into is this this that right click damage. So, opting into a witch stalker here. Now this you could go with literally any of these crests. I would say that Witch Soccer in general is better, in my opinion, than Brutal Axe, just because you're getting the Omni Vamp versus the Life Steal. But there are pros and cons to each of them and the effects that they have. But this is just giving you a way to get out of CC. But Ice Scorn Talons, absolutely phenomenal. Nex, phenomenal. Um, Phoenix, definitely valuable, although I found most of the time that. It's not super necessary if you're playing on the, you know, if you're playing right on the edge or if you have a lot of burst or if you're the only frontline person, Phoenix is definitely very useful, but you'll get a lot of value out of just having the Ice Scorn or the CC uh, Cleanse 
or the extra mobility from next. So our first kind of on hit effect here is going to be bone saw. Now, this one is particularly good for staying on top of opponents because you're going to you no know, most of, most of the time you will close the gap either with your dash or by pulling them in or whatever. You'll auto attack and then you'll double pain. That double pain will apply or the auto attack after, you know, depending on when you get that auto attack in, will apply the slow and the max health damage. So this is crazy, especially since it's giving you a ramping bonus attack speed as well, which works very well with your ultimate and everything. Overall, just a phenomenal item for Grux in particular. Now, then we can go into Mutilator, surprise, surprise. This is where we're going to get a lot of our sustain. We are going to have that um, 3 or 3% enemy hero max health damage on our right click. We're going to steal max health to make some of our other items even more effective. Overall, just, you know, it's hard to go wrong with Mutilator. It wouldn't surprise me if this item gets tweaked. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't really get nerfed per se, because it's kind of a very necessary effect at the moment, but it might be overtuned. Uh, anyway, that aside, augmentation next up. This is going to give us the ability to stay on top of opponents. Grux has a lot of gap close and everything, but if the opponent manages to survive that full on combo, if they are a tankier opponent, or if you miss one of the stuns or something along those lines, or if you had to use your dash to gap close, someone gets the stun ball off on you, so your so gets a stun off on you. I was thinking Decker specifically of a stun ball, um, so it's more difficult for you to then like stay on top. You can pull someone in, you can ult them, and then you you don't necessarily have to then close the gap with your dash because you have this extra movement speed. It just gives you more flexibility inside your kit, plus bonus on hit damage, true damage. It's, um, yeah, hard to go wrong with that. And then here, Salvation. Salvation is just giving us another really big chunk of health. All of these items so far, again, have health on them. It's giving us Omnivamp, which is going to stack with our passive more often than not, and be able to give us, at the, let's see, at that point, if you have your passive, you have this, and you have the Witch Stalker, you're up to 28%, which is a lot of healing. Once again, anti-heal, if you're seeing someone building this way. And then last but not least, rounding out with the Basilisk, because your right click applies two stacks of Corrode, this ramps up very, very quickly. And you can even build this a little bit earlier into the build to have uh, slightly more aggression. Uh, but you might, it, it really just depends. <laughs> Where you build some of these things is going to be a bit of personal preference. I really like to have those effects that help me stay on top of opponents and that help me survive, but you could definitely build this over a mutilator, and you could even go away from the mutilator entirely and opt into another fizz pen item like an omen or, you know, your tainted blade, something along those lines, or even a nightfall if you're in that 1v1 situation frequently, or if you can force the 1v1 situation frequently. So he's got a lot of flexibility in here, but Basilisk gets a lot of damage. Really, really strong on him since he can ramp up that Corrode relatively quickly. So out of the offlane, we can definitely see that there are some similarities here in our core items. But we're definitely opting into a lot more durability overall. So we're, we're actually building into some armor. We're still playing for those on-hit effects, but they're coming a little bit later. We're getting, again, some more of that durability and sustain. You don't necessarily have to play it this way, but this is just the example that I chose to go with um, so that you can have a, a good idea of, of what that looks like to really play a bruiser-style uh, Grux out of soul. And so starting off, Ice Scorn Talons. This, is, this, has been, this has been an item that has overperformed for me. As a crest, it's extremely strong. That movement speed slow is so good for being able to set up pulls, for being able to, you know, you can dash in, you can proc this. If they're near the edge, you can often close the gap for that pull. It's so absurdly strong. Plus, the bonus damage doesn't hurt. 
And then here, going into uh, the bone saw, so that you can have an on hit effect of slow. It's a lot of damage. It really is. It's a lot of damage, and this is a lot of health. So at this point, once you have this online, it's very difficult for a lot of characters to actually box with you, and you can really push that advantage pretty heavily. Now next up, I did put the physical armor next, just because... So, but this is something where you will have to make an adjustment, because sometimes you're in a physical matchup, sometimes you're not, right? Um, sometimes you're in a magic power matchup. So you might need to go for the Unbroken Will here in this slot, flip them around. You might need to delay the Mutilator even a little bit further. You might even want to build Mutilator first before this item. So the build order here is very flexible based on the needs of the game itself. But Citadel, this is giving us that armor shred, it's giving us more health, it's giving us power. There's not a whole lot that you, you don't love about this item, particularly on someone like Brox. So then, again, Mutilator. <laughs> Get used to seeing this item a lot until until it gets changed or until uh, until other items get brought up to a similar level because it is just exceptionally powerful at the moment. And then going into our magical armor, you have a lot of options here. Legacy is particularly powerful. I threw in the Unbroken Will because it's something that is in that for all tanks list that I don't want people to forget about. It's an extremely powerful effect with that damage mitigation and everything. But again, you could opt into a legacy. You could opt into even something a little heavier duty, like a crystalline cuirass, something along those lines. You've got a ton of options for that magical magical defense slot. You just want some physical and magical armor is really what it comes down to. And then finally, we're rounding this out with augmentation. Just that nice true damage scaling into the late game so that your your damage you have this nice kind of curve where you have a little bit of damage, a little bit of defense, a little bit of damage, a little bit of defense, and then you're you're rounding out with that last little bit of damage that you need. Now, this can definitely be something swapped out to something like Salvation, or if you need more physical armor, then you can certainly opt into like a Warden's Faith or something along those lines, or a Tainted Guard even. If you need anti-heal, this can easily become a Tainted Blade. Tons of flexibility in this slot, but overall, augmentation is extremely powerful in Grox and something you always want to be thinking about whenever you're building them. This one might sound crazy at first. There might even be some crazy elements inside of this, but Grox support, when you, as long as you start your Q, your pull, it feels incredibly good. It feels It is a lot of fun to play, and it's something that can be very effective. It is something that is relatively aggressive. You definitely have to be careful in your, if they are double ranged, say it's an ADC and a Decker or a Muriel or something those, along those lines, you have to be really careful about how you approach the landing stage, but it gives you a lot of opportunities for control, it gives you the ability to pull people off of your ADC. The extra stuns are no joke. And then in this particular build, we have a lot of effects that just help either add control to it or allow you to, to just do Grux things and have a decent chunk of damage inside of your kit. All right, so first off here will be the Rift Walkers. So this, honestly, a lot of the times you might end up just going into Sanctification, but Riftwalkers is excellent for being able to have that extra gap closed to be able to pull someone. It makes a big difference when you just have that little bit of extra mobility and, and you can start a fight a lot more efficiently that way. But Sanctification is an excellent item that fits very well in this build as well. And then and you can go either direction just depending on what you feel like you need or what fits your playstyle. Dynamo, this is, we're getting a bunch of burst damage on this. Um, you have three different ways that you can trigger it. Granted, 12 second cooldown, so you're not doing it all at once, right? You're only doing it w once um, every 12 seconds. But it doesn't matter if you're starting with your charge, your pull, your ultimate, just depending on what, you, you know, if you were able to close the gap or whatever. 
Dynamo is going to trigger, you're going to get a burst of damage, it's got a good chunk of health, good way for you to be able to stand in front of your opponents, and amps up your allies damage. Really nothing that, uh, nothing to dislike there. And the next Vanguardian, this is again ramping up our own defenses while giving a little bit to allies, and that's very, uh, very useful effect. I'm getting a little sleepy. Woo! been recording for a long time but anyway very very useful effect for helping to keep allies alive while also just staying alive yourself that initial hit yes might do a lot of damage but once you have those extra protections online you it'll feel pretty good frost guard a lot of this build is based around slows as you can see with frost guard going into the Painted Totem. So we've got these AoE slows around us. We're slowing attack speed. As we are closing the gap, as we're running at opponents, we are making it more difficult for them to get away from us. And then kind of a weird item, because this has magical power on it, and I don't recommend building it on Grox outside of support, but the beautiful thing about this is auto, right-click, auto, they're rooted. So this gives you yet another piece of control that you can apply very, very quickly that will catch could potentially turn the tide of battle. You can also build this a little bit earlier. You can opt into something instead of the Tainted Totem. You can definitely go into a Void Helm if there's a lot of consistent magical damage effects, say a Gadget Ultimate or something along those lines, or even Gadget Right Click. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind as well. Do you have a lot of flexibility here? But I just kind of want to highlight Elafrost because even though, yes, it's magical power, the other stats on it are decent. And then just having that extra piece of control as a support is definitely something you don't want to forget about and even could potentially use on someone like a Steel or Richter or whatever. But Grox in particular, he is exceptionally good at being able to keep a target in one place and adding another tool on top of that. It's just cool that you can do it as quickly as you can. All right, Severog. Severog is also a little bit interesting, similar to Crunch, where he has both magical and physical power scaling on the on the skill that the damage skill that matters, which is his siphon. But the biggest thing that you always want to keep in mind with Severog is that you really you have to stack. Practice, 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 practice. I really recommend going into the practice mode, practicing how to stack out of your minion waves, stacking off of jungle camps. One thing to keep in mind is that red buff and blue buff do both provide three stacks. So that does accelerate your stacking out of the jungle a little bit so that it is closer to what you would get out of a lane. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. I believe those are the only two things that give those bonus stacks. Um, as far as I know. <laughs> the other thing to keep in mind, too, for Cyberog, he heals for the damage dealt from his Q. Now, in the early stages, it's not a ton because you're not doing a ton of damage, but keep that in mind for your early trades and everything. That even though you are still wanting to stack, try and always hit your opponent with that Q after you've taken some some auto attack trades, after you've traded inside of the minion wave a little bit so that you have that minion wave control. Try and try and don't just walk up and Q someone when you're at full health and everything. Try and manage that so that you are still getting value out of the healing, especially during the laning phase, because it can do a lot for you. And then otherwise, his, his kit is just fantastic. He has a root. His knockback is phenomenal. It feels very good. Honestly, it feels better than it did in Paragon, because it feels more consistent. Like, you're not having these weird things where you're having to aim the height and all of that, like it genuinely just feels great. I love the way that they set that up. All right, so let's start with Severog offlane. With this, 
Once again, you're going to see what apparently is my favorite crest. I didn't realize that I had put this as the recommended one on so many people, but Tempest is exceptional. We're getting the healing. We're going to have a solid amount of magical power to scale this up. And it's just an extra way to deal damage to those targets around you. Um, Obelisk also actually fits fairly well with how he wants to play. Ice Scorn Talons can also be quite valuable. Again, he has that physical scaling on, um, on his Q, so it opens up some of these other windows where you can do something like that, where you can even go into a Rogue Crest or something like that out of the jungle. And then two, you can also just opt for any of the Titan options that allow you to sustain, that allow you to run at your opponents. You can go for a full tank version with Tainted, uh, Tainted Guard and Fire Blossom and all of that, and it can be really, really effective. So yeah, just some, some kind of cool things to keep in mind that his crests are actually very, very flexible. Um, yeah, okay. So, first actual item here that we're going to go into is going to be the Lock Shawl. So, we're going to build the Tier 2 of this, we're going to go build our next two items, and then we're going to come back and build Leviathan. Once it's, basically once it's stacked. Um, I don't know why, but for me, it feels like it takes forever to stack Leviathan compared to other stacking items. So, that's why I keep saying that we're building the next two and then coming back for it. But if you end up stacking it faster and you have the opportunity to go back and finish it, go back and finish it. That's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with uh, with doing that. But all right, then next up, we're going to go into the Hexbound Bracers. So mana is definitely a concern for Severog, but primarily the reason that we're going into this is the cooldown reduction, the ability haste aspect of it. Because 35 ability haste is a lot. Between that and the Leviathan, we're going to have a ton. Your your Q, your Siphon, is going to be on like a two second cooldown by the time that you have both of these items and Flux online. That's a, a lot of damage, a lot of very consistent damage very, very quickly. So that's why I like the Hexbound. It lets you spam as you're standing in the face of your opponents. But that said, you can absolutely opt into a Fire Blossom in this slot and go for the I'm going to stand near you damage rather than the Hexbound. You do have the one ability that amps up the Fire Blossom damage, the root, so if you can get that root off while you are nearby to the opponent, it can really add up in terms of what Fire Blossom can do. But Hexbound for me has definitely been one that has been performing exceptionally well and something that you should consider for sure. Flux Matrix, if we're going to be hitting someone with a magic damage ability every couple of seconds, we should probably amp that up. We don't care as much about the tenacity aspect of this, not as much as we did for, say, Richter or Steel, but the damage amp for, for his Siphon, it, it does a lot for us. And then next up, going into the world breaker so again we are spamming abilities we are spamming them really really fast the ability cooldown is lower than the stack cooldown for world breaker which makes it especially easy to get up to that max stacks and then also we have leviathan which is giving us max health we have seb's passive which is giving us max health you can opt into a titan item which is giving us max health we've got flux giving us max health as you can see there's a theme here so Worldbreaker, the percentage of, we're going to get a ton of bonus magical power here. Now granted, our magical power scaling on the Q is not as big as the physical power scaling, but these items just work exceptionally well together to give us some, some really good options. And then last but not least, I did put in here as an option, Raymond of Renewal. So this increases your healing. So this is going to increase the healing from your Q. It is a massive amount of actual health and mana and regen and ability. This is so many good stats. It's one of those items that's on the all tanks can consider this thing. Um, I want to kind of highlight it here because it fits so well inside of this build. Now that said, there will be a lot of times where you just need more physical armor. And you'll have to go into the Warden's Faith or 
something along those lines, or even just building the hot, the fire blossom on top of the hex bound. Maybe you you know change that build order a little bit so you take advantage of the AOE early on. That's definitely also a possibility to consider. But Raymond does just fit inside of this build really effectively, where you just you get on top of someone and just Q Q Q Q, and you you've got this healing going. You've got the healing that you're taking or you, that you're regenerating over time. You've got you know five thousand health. All right, that's probably a slight exaggeration, but it's very very difficult for someone to actually deal with you at that point. Now out of the jungle, I, I did something really. Uh, I th this build in particular is a little bit of a strange build. As you can see, I moved away from the a lot of the core items that I think are very good on Severog out of the jungle. I think you can do some very interesting things on him, like the Oathkeeper Painweaver combination. But I just wanted to highlight that since he has that really high physical power scaling on his Q, and that's kind of where our focus is, is really spamming that out, that there is the possibility to go for a more physical damage-oriented route. Uh, the recommended build and everything is going to be a little bit different, and you can check the spreadsheet for that to be able to see a little bit more of the normal way to go. But, just to highlight again, this is something that you have the option to do. You can go into an Ice Scorn Talons. I really, really like this item, or this crest. It's been very, very strong overall. But as you can see here, you have a ton of options. You can even go into a Nex if you really want to. I didn't include that one in there in this particular one just because you already have the dash, you have the root, you have a lot of ways to kind of close that gap. But Nex does allow you to potentially get behind an opponent for an ultimate, something along those lines. You can also go just for the full tank route with any of those options. You can go for a more burst assassin route through the uh, through an obelisk or something along those lines as well. So you get a ton of options, but for this fizz power build. Going to the Ice Corn Talons just so you can help you stay on top of opponents once you're in range. You know, you root someone, you pop the Ice Corn as you get a little bit close, and then you can save your dash to be able to um, get on top of them after their mobility skills and things like that. Going into then a Mutilator, surprise, surprise, Omnivamp, damage on hit that's dealing a percent of the max health. What's not to like here? And then. <laughs> In, one of the items that I think is cool, if not necessarily the strongest of items, though I do think it's better than Combustion, if I'm being honest with you, Inferno. So, this, abilities burn enemy units, additional physical power over 3 seconds, or additional damage based on your physical power over 33 seconds. Can you tell it's been a bit of a long day? Anyway, so additional damage... Over three seconds, again, you're very spammy, it's more ability haste, and then after that, we're opting into the physical armor aspect, which, I'll be honest, Frost Guard should probably just be Hexbound Bracers, but this is nice, because it gives us both health and mana, um, and then the slow around you is not irrelevant, right? Again, with the Ice Corn Talons and everything, being able to stay on, on top of opponents. It's not necessarily that Seb's thing that's something that Seb struggles with, but it just lets you kind of amplify that aspect of your kit a little bit more. But you can definitely go into the Hex Brown Bracers here. You could even go into, opt into the Fire Blossom. Um, we're not building a ton of health in this particular one, but it does work as we are then building into the salvation. So just keep in mind that you have a lot of flexibility in that physical armor slot in particular. And then salvation, we're getting a big chunk of health, we're getting a shield, we're getting more omnivamp. No surprise once again to see that and mutilator working very well together. And then just to round out the build, and this is something you can definitely build earlier if you need that magic armor, though most of the time I don't think you will. Flux Matrix, just a nice, solid way to round out the build, give yourself a little bit of extra health. So Salvation Flux Matrix like, and, and Frost Guard, we're getting a decent chunk of health from all of that. We're getting some damage amp. We're getting some useful effects. And the core idea is that like you could shift those around if you need to. 
You could drop the Infernum if you wanted to, build into a Draconum, build into your Tainted Scepter. That's probably what I would replace more often than not, as far as these things go. But, again, you have a lot of flexibility here. I would say that Flux Matrix is very excellent, though. And again, check the spreadsheet for some of, some of the more normal builds for him out of jungle. Our final hero has arrived. Rampage. One thick boy. One rocky boy. So, Rampage. Bonuses when he's inside of the jungle that are active while he has his ultimate going. Really, he, what he excels at more than anything, pardon me, more than anything, is being able to go into the opponent's jungle in the early stages and fight. And unless opponents are really good at collapsing on you, they're going to have a really hard time being able to deal with that. Especially if you can do it on the sides of the map where you have priority in your lanes. And I need to make a lot more videos. Anyway, so that you know what that means. But if you're doing it in those areas where you have priority, where you, your lanes are pushing and you have the potential for your allies to rotate just as quickly is really what that comes down to, then being able to invade is something that Rampage is exceptional at. Also, his rock, assuming that you can hit it, is excellent at setting up ganks, at being able to set up some things like like uh, Murdoch Trap and things like that, or even just Ducker Stunball follow-ups or Richter Hooks. Lots of, like it is relatively easy skill shot to hit. It's a fairly large rock. You just have to anticipate based on the uh, where they're gonna be. You will miss some rocks, but anyway, I I'm rambling. Then he's got a slow inside of his kit. His jump. The one thing that I want to highlight here actually is the jungle pathing for rampage because you can actually start on your rumble, grab pounce. At level 2, start blue buff. Okay? Blue buff is going to give you the mana regen and then the bonus damage to, to minions, which includes all the jungle camps. So you can start with rumble, clear the blue buff relatively quickly, jump over to the back camp uh, near mid lane, go to red buff, and then be at the river buff timers by about 250. You might have to jump over the wall, but you will be level 3 with blue and red buff at that bu at the river buff before it spawns. His clear is exceptionally fast. Just keep that in mind as a possible path that you can take. Of course, there are a lot of other options if you want to go for the level 2 gank in duo or solo lane or even in mid lane, then obviously you'll want to path accordingly. So, he is the king of the jungle. There's definitely a reason that jungle is going to be his primary role. So we've got a lot of things going on in this build. Let's jump right into it. So first off, Witch Stalker. This, the core idea behind this is that Rampage, if you can't get your ultimate off, you will die. It's basically that simple. Witch Stalker allows you to have a little bit more wiggle room if you get caught out, or if you misjudge how much damage that you're taking. Or if you just want to be able to get into a fight and ult right off the bat, but you get stunned or whatever, you can take that off and still get into it relatively quickly. It's just an extra layer of safety there. You can go a heavier tank route, you can go more of a brawler route with the warrior crests and things like that. Ton of fantastic options for Rampage. The only thing I'll say is I don't think he really needs Nex. I think that that's... While it's a decent option... You have the extremely long range stun, and then you also have your jump. It's not hard to stay on top of people as Rampage. And our first item here, um, no surprise, we're going to go into Overlord. So, Rampage, as a part of his kit, he wants to be building a, a lot of health because his regeneration is based on his max health. He also because he his ultimate gives him attack speed and everything like that and being in the jungle gives you attack speed overlord it, it ramps up your clear gives you AOD, aoe damage in team fights and it's just absolutely phenomenal overall next up pain weaver so this one admittedly okay it feels good 
I, I have played with it a couple of times out of the jungle, and it feels very solid. It gives you a good amount of burst damage, but with the caveat that something like just building a basilisk and and in this slot and moving into something else as far as defensive layers down the line, whether it be a Tannin Totem or something along those lines, could just be better. But Pain Weaver, it gives you a lot of opportunities in the early stages of the game to rock someone, jump on their face, hit them, and just have a bunch of of damage right there, right? Or if you can rock them, walk up, auto attack, wait those 1.5 seconds, like auto auto, basically, rumble, auto, it's a lot of extra burst damage. So it just improves your kill potential in those early stages, but again, might not be an entirely necessary include. So with that too, then we're moving into augmentation. This one is definitely going to be a core item for Rampage and basically all of his, all situations. You're giving your movement speed and your ultimate means that you're much more difficult to kite. Again, we have the Witch Stalker so that once you pop your ult and you get stunned or whatever, you can cleanse that and you can still close the gap without necessarily having to pounce. Granted, pouncing is great, nothing wrong with that, but say you pounce, you get pushed back by Murdoch, you've still got this extra movement speed for a couple of seconds to be able to help you close the distance again, so that you can actually keep fighting. Now, since Rampage in this iteration is more of a an auto-attack character, um, trying to remember what stats are on this item, there we go. Or you can go into a basilisk and it can do a lot of work. Now, the the kind of one weird thing about this is that your rock does magical damage. So it won't boost the damage of your rock, other than the fact that your rock has physical power scaling, but it will boost the damage of your auto attacks, your rumble, and your pounce. Kind of strange, just in terms of the armor shred specifically, but at the same time, it works. And yeah, the, so with this, especially once you have the attack speed from augmentation, you have the attack speed from your ultimate, you can stack this up very, very quickly with rumble. Overall, just an exceptional item to, to throw onto him. And then salvation, omnivamp toward the end of things, it is possible that a mutilator or something along those lines could be even better. I didn't include it in this particular build because that's the slot where we have the Pain Weaver. Um, but in Salvation, getting that shield, getting the Omni Vamp and everything, we're building a lot of health in this build. More damage for Overlord. Honestly, there's just not a whole lot that this doesn't do for you. Alright, Offlane. One more to go after this. Woo! Alright, so, Overlord. Leviathan. These are going to be core items for you most of the time. Now, in the example build, I have opted for the, the, the like full tank. If you're hitting me, you are going to hate yourself rampage because I think it is extremely effective and just a lot of fun to play. I think your laning phase is still very smooth, but I will say, you can definitely opt into a more aggressive route. They're going to have some example builds around that of just different ways that you can get into it. Um, so starting out, we're going to have Razorback as our crest. So again, this is that idea of like, if I'm standing in front of you, you are hitting me, you are going to get punished for it. For reflect damage, it doesn't last very long. So you do have to make sure you use this wisely, that you time it well that you don't uh, pop it as you're walking in off of the stun, because obviously then they're not going to be hitting you. Use it wisely. Four seconds. It's not a long time, but it is very effective when you actually use it. So then looking at it, then our first actual item is going to be the Lock Shawl. We're going to build the Tier 2 of this. Then we're going to finish Finer Blossom. And then, depending on what you need, you can go into your Magical Defense, the Kiras, or you can just go straight into the Tainted Guard, and then we can come back and finish the uh, Leviathan. So this is going to give us a little bit of scaling damage for our Pounce, but more than anything, it's going to give us 
uh, Leviathan is going to give us cooldown reduction based on all the health that we are building into the build. And then it is also going to give us... Um, it, oh, shoot. it is also going to give you more health for your ultimate so that you because your passive is based on a percentage of your maximum health you're going to get a lot more out of it by having the leviathan built in like i said the first item that we're going to truly finish will be the fire blossom where are you the fire blossom draconum also an option but fire blossom is great for the laning phase especially between this and rumble it's very easy for you to clear out camps to invade in the jungle, to be able to clear the waves faster than your opponent so that you can make those rotations early on. Because even though you're in the offlane, you really want to spend most of your time in the jungle, ideally in the opponent's jungle, taking their camps, fighting them, harassing. And so the faster that you can clear, the better. And getting some durability alongside that is especially important. And of course, with this, we're ramping up our max health like mad here in this build so that that uh, the passive of fire blossom is going to do a lot now then again tainted guard you know you can switch around if you need the magical armor earlier grab it earlier but tainted guard is kind of the other centerpiece of this build because this is why we're building triple fizz defense items because we're going to apply that elite bleed based on the amount of bonus physical armor that we have. Rampage, especially with the healing and everything like that. And stacking all of this Fee's defense, you become the worst nightmare for ADCs. You're very, very difficult to deal with. You've got the, this anti-heal built in. You're big, you're throwing rocks at them. They can't really hit you. If they are hitting you, you can pop the razor back and then they hate themselves. It just becomes very difficult for an ADC to do anything, I say, as an ADC, as a person who frequently plays that role. And then for our magical defense, I opt in for Crystalline Kiras here. There's a lot of options that you can go into, but this gives you the pulses of damage that can come when you're take, whenever you take one every 1.5 seconds, you can get this pulse that deals 20 plus 3% of your max health damage. Again, we're stacking a ton of max health. You're standing in the middle of the team, they're trying to focus you down, and everyone's just getting hit for it. It's great. And then the core idea is that by the time you're dead, they've used up so many of their resources that the rest of your team can clean up. And then Warden's Faith, nice way to round things out. Basic ability, cooldown reduction. We already have some cooldown reduction from finishing Leviathan, but we don't have much else. So having the ability... Um, reducing the current ability cooldowns every time you get hit again they're getting punished for hitting you you're rumbling more often you're jumping more often you might be able to jump in and get your ult off and everything like that go through that sequence of skills and then be able to jump out very easily within a few seconds if you're just taking a bunch of hits so it makes you very difficult to deal with just having that extra cooldown reduction now granted Another really solid option is also Stonewall, since you want to be standing in the enemy team. The extra um, stun can definitely do a lot to get you out of some bad situations, but generally speaking, I think Warden's Faith is just an excellent way to round out this build. And then last but not least, we have Rampage Support. Support Rampage is so much fun to play. You can duck into fall walls, throw rocks at people, it's, it's great. And you have some... Just fantastic options in terms of items and everything like that especially since he wants to build a bunch of health already let's, oh, let's go ahead and dive into the example built here there's definitely a few different ways that you can go about this uh the, some that are a little more selfish some that are a little more a little less so um this one in particular is a more team oriented build where you're focused on getting those rocks off getting those slows off and, and being in general a nuisance. But Sanctification is just a wonderful layer of defense because we're building a ton of health in this build. And then we're going to amp that up even with Tainted Totem, which is going to affect our passive and then also give us, again, a boost to that Sanctification toward the end of the build. And also, Rampage loves building health. Granted, a lot of percent health in the game, so, you know, it balances out, but it's nice nonetheless. 
So Hexbound, mostly for the cooldown reduction. It's nice to start on the physical armor. Obviously, a lot of these a lot of these builds have gone Hexbound into Vanguardian. It's a really nice way as a support to be able to sequence getting your physical armor into your health and magical armor. So you kind of get everything covered in those first couple of items. Especially since usually that at that point you're still a little bit behind item wise. So you might be having to take some of those bigger fights. Having all of your basic bases covered is just really, really nice. Again, Hexbound mostly for the cooldown reduction so that you can throw the rocks more often. You can rumble more often. Those two in particular. Vanguardian, just that nice defensive tool that's giving uh, a little bit extra to your allies. And then going into a dynamo. So this is where we're going to put some of our bonus health to use. And then also just, again, make it easier. We've talked about this a few times, the dynamo, to take down really beefy targets, like even this Rampage build, <laughs> in the later stages of the game, or even in the mid-game, since we're building this relatively early. And then from there, opting into the Tainted Totems, this is going to give us a slow around us. The slow isn't huge, but it's relevant, right? Especially if you can stack it with some other slows, like even Sparrow Halo of Arrows, or something along those lines. Or even just help your ADC make space, make it harder for opponents to get away from you. And then the passive itself gives you more health and or like health regen inside of your ultimate, which is definitely relevant. And is like I said, going to amp up our sanctification. And then rounding it out with just an, the the nice big boy um, health item in Raiment of Renewal. So with this. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so with this big chunk of health more healing and increases all your healing received which includes the regeneration from your ultimate as well as the raiment passive itself so this will all help you stand in front of opponents stand between opponents and your adc and your mid laner etc and just be a nuisance more than anything and even in the early stages you can still do have a lot of the same patterns that you would out of offlane but like i said you can certainly go for a more selfish build go for a fire blossom and things like that and just play to invade at once you've got your and come back for your stacks and everything like that as long as your adc knows to play safe while you're gone yada 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 you can still very much be a jungle bully even playing him out of support but don't don't underestimate how much Rampage offers as a support. And that's it. That is our comprehensive build guide. Again, links in the description. Use the spreadsheet. That is what is going to be kept up to date as we tweak these builds, as we make them more comfortable, as we come up with new ideas. And as, again, balance changes and things like that, that is what will be kept truly up to date watch the updates on the front page, take, use that, share it as long as you credit. Please don't try and take credit for yourself, yada, yada, yada. Other links, if you have questions, if there are build theories that you want to talk about, if there's anything at all, Discord, Twitch, both great places to find me. And just hit those links in the description below. You can also hit me up on Twitter, but I will probably take longer to respond to that because I'm not there very often. I might even move to a different platform given that Twitter is kind of on fire right now. So, eh, whatever. Twitch and Discord, however, those links, very reliable ways to get a hold of me. Again, shout out to Noxious and JungleCamps.xyz for having a great website so that we can look at items and everything like that without having to be inside of the game. It's been doing a great job keeping up with updates and everything there. And for everyone, I hope this is helpful. I hope that you have fun with it. If you have questions, also comments, you can throw comments in there. I respond to those pretty regularly. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you have a wonderful week and good luck out there.